Your business has unit economics that need to be adjusted. There needs to be a fundamental shift in the way that you're advertising. Let me take this online, Shopify store, set up all the ads, zero to 150K per month in two to three months. That's crazy. This is a type of content that not only does it go viral on Instagram or TikTok, it also drives sales. The problem is there's a misalignment between what was sold and what was actioned. Consumers are smarter. No one's just clicking an ad and buying. In fact, probably most of the time people are like, I don't know if this is real or not. A brand that has a personal brand behind it from a founder or some sort of celebrity endorsement is almost like guaranteed success. <laughs> yeah. so like I was self-taught in Photoshop at the age of like 10 or 12. You know, I was editing photos, I was creating graphics, I guess the only thing was I had never seen anyone do business. I came across dropshipping on YouTube, you know, as every good agency story starts. <laughs> so I started a watch brand. It was like just like a copy of, you know, Danu Wellington style mm. or MVMT style watches. Yeah, yeah. Funnily enough, I, I set up that website and I made it look exactly like the iconic. And so I actually got sued. Last year, we probably saw the earliest Black Friday. November, Black Friday, people buy more. Christmas than they do in Black Friday, than they do actual Christmas. Black Friday planning, you know, from an ad perspective, it's all about creative variety. What do you want out of life? Like, do you want something, you know, where you're running it and your profit margin is really thin and so you're stressed all the time? Or do you want like a lifestyle business? All right, guys, welcome back. We have another awesome e-com episode for you guys. We had Manu Verma on the pod today, one of the best digital marketers I've ever come across, one of the brightest minds in e-commerce, literally an e-commerce encyclopedia. So we're going to go deep into that. He's worked across startup brands all the way up to brands doing $3 million a month plus. So he really knows a lot about scaling brands. So we'll get into it in a second. Before we do, can I ask for a few favors? If you're watching on YouTube, could you like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already? Really appreciate everyone that's, that's been doing it lately. Um, it doesn't go unnoticed. And if you're listening, on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Could you, if you could leave a five-star review, I'd really appreciate it. It helps the podcast grow and we can continue to bring you better and better guests. So guys, let's get into it. We've got another econ banger coming your way. So Manu, we've known each other. We work together for a number of years now. So for those who don't know Manu, the founder and CEO of Nuva Digital, an e-commerce growth partner now. Something really different, a little bit different. And I was just explaining it to you, our producer, um, before you got here. Um, you, you, the, the way you kind of work is really appealed to me, right? And we were having this discussion off air. The way you do it, obviously you're external and then you're not working inside the business, but you are much more of a in-house digital marketing team rather than a you know, completely external agency. And I can attest to that, you know, with my experience working with you. So I'm going to speak about a bunch of things in today's episode. Um, obviously a lot around paid media and ads and, and marketing, because that's kind of what you're really known for and where your biggest skills are, but also, you know, e-com and agency world are you know, kind of go hand in hand with a lot of like the, the millennial entrepreneurs or the Gen Z entrepreneurs. So we'll t chat a little bit about that. But just a little bit about Manu and his, and, and his agency before we get into it so people can know what to expect. So, you know, you've been involved with, you know, several seven and eight figure e-com brands, like particularly Australian brands, scaled brands up to 3 million per month, per month. So massive numbers. And some of the areas of expertise that you have that I, I definitely want to focus on um, in this pod, profitability modeling, content production, landing pages, CRO, rapid testing and attribution tracking, and, and as well as obviously paid ads across all the main platforms, Meta, Google, TikTok, Snapchat, and Pinterest as well. Um, and I kind of want to get into your head and get some of the agency secrets and put it out there for all the people in e-com listening so they can implement it uh, into their own business or in their process of starting their businesses. But um, thank you for coming in, man, and, and, and welcome to the pod. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, so where we'll start, man, I, I, uh, I remember we interviewed you for Happy Skin Co. This would have been early. This would have been like a year into the business. Um, you left both me, this is when George was still in the business. Both me and George were both very impressed with you and, and stood out massively. So when I, like, when I say I wanted to get Manu in, one of the probably most intelligent digital marketers I've ever come across and I've come ac across a lot of, in my time, uh, you really impressed us with the way you explained things and how dedicated and passionate you were about e -com. And this was early on, this would have been like 20, probably like early 2019. And you, I remember you saying you had some plug into your Facebook account that your Facebook was only ads. So it's like, this guy's a full on e-com nerd and like in the best possible way. Um, so tell me how all that journey started and, tell, and the story of you started as a junior in your first agency, first job out of uni and within two years, you were the head of marketing for the whole agency. So give me a little bit of a, everyone, a little bit of an understanding about kind of your journey outside of uni and how we got to that point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, it feels like it's been you know, <laughs> forever, but not that long. And, you know, the journey has been awesome. And I remember that interview with happy yeah. skin, like, you know, I think passion feeds passion, you know? Yeah. So I came in with passion and yeah. you guys were so passionate and you just saw it. I think at the time you offered me like double what my salary was, <laughs> yeah. you know? And I was like, wow, you know, these guys are into it, but you know, the, location and just yeah. changing things. And so, you know, I couldn't take it at the time, but 
now we get to work together for like several years, which is sure. awesome. Um, yeah, it's been a journey. Like I think as a kid, I was always very tech focused. Mm-hmm. I liked, you know, I liked computers. I liked software, like downloading things, you know, pirating videos and movies. <laughs> make- Lime wire days and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And so I knew I wanted to do something that was like tech focused, but then I also had this creative part of me. Like I was self-taught in Photoshop at the age of like 10 or 12. You know, I was editing photos. I was creating graphics, all that. Um, and then moving into high school, you know, going into that, that learning the whole engineering, the tech side and all that. Um, I guess the only thing was I had never seen anyone do business. Like my family, all my friends, they were just, you know, white collar jobs. Yeah. So that was one of the things where I was like, okay. And, and so business never really stood out to me. I was like, I didn't even know it was a thing. I didn't know it existed. I had no idea how to start or anything. Same thing for me, man. Like you just think of the traditional go to uni, get a job. That's the highest you can aim, right? That's yeah. kind of what, what was surrounding us. Yes, go on. Yeah, exactly. So you, you don't really understand that. And then in university, like, I mean, academic. What do you study in uni? Information systems. Okay. So I literally, I didn't even know really what I was applying for. <laughs> um, but, you know, one of our teachers was like, hey, there's this scholarship and, you know, you've, you've probably got good odds. And then I, I literally Wikipedia searched, you know, what is information systems? And it was like, oh, it's the bridge between computer science and business. And I was like, oh, that's, that sounds that fun. Sounds interesting. And so, you know, I did this interview for this scholarship and they were like, what is information systems? And I literally repeated that exact <laughs> line, Wikipedia. you know, and then they, they gave that to me. And so, yeah, I was lucky enough in uni to do like a few months of corporate work experience. So I worked at Westpac, I worked at PwC, I did Deloitte, all these big companies. Um, and it was fun. Like I had a good time. Um, was there any interest in going the big corporate route? Because you could have done really well in that yeah, space. Yeah, absolutely. Like I had offers and, and it was good and it was fun and I enjoyed it. Um, but I guess there was a part of me that, that was like, I, I just don't feel like that level of fulfillment. Like something yeah. is something missing. Maybe I want to do more. And it was, I, I mean, I'm very risk averse. So I knew like, okay, I can come back to this at any point in time. Um, but during those last few years, my mom actually started a business. And that was the first time I was like, oh, okay, let's do something. Mm-hmm. And how do we make it happen? So at that same time, one of my friends started developing websites. He was like, hey, come to my house. I'll show you how to build a WordPress site. We'll get this theme together. And so I learned all of that. And I was like, cool, mom, I can do your website now. <laughs> yeah. You know, so she opened- What year would this be? Like, what year was this? Like, late teen? Like, late, like- This would have been like 2015. Yeah, yeah you know, 2015. Like, like, nine years ago now. Yep. So, you know, um, my, my mom's like, yeah, I'm starting a website. Um, and I'm like, cool, I'll, I'll build this for you. So she started a wellness center. You know, I made the website. That was my first, like- look at digital marketing. Like, what is this? You put up a website, you get a domain, you get the hosting. Um, it all, and it was just me doing it, you know? So I got, I literally learned everything from scratch, um, how to do SEO, how do you rank on Google, Google maps. Um, and then I remember I was like, I built it all and I was like, cool, let's get some customers. Obviously no one comes just like <laughs> just that. Comes, right? so yeah. I was like, how do you actually get clients, customers for local business? So I went on and I did a Udemy course on, on local lead generation on Facebook. And I was like, cool. So I was like, okay, so I need to take some photos. I, I said, hey, bring in a customer. We took a photo. We took some videos. I did that. I set up this lead generation campaign on Facebook. And suddenly all these people are inquiring, you know, I want this treatment. I want this treatment. They're coming in. My mom's calendar's booked out. So it's like your mom's something in the hairdressing space for the sound? Yeah, or? well, it was like a, a, a beauty, beauty, beauty space, so, yeah, right? yeah. beauty and health, wellness. Yep. Um, and so, and it was nice. It was traditional, you know, she was offering these interesting services cool. and it was just a home business. Yeah. And I'm seeing her calendar filled, filled out and I'm, you know, from zero, we're taking this business up, you know, to several thousand per month. I'm like, wow, that's, now that was impact. And that was your first time. And, the first and, time. and isn't it like so addictive and me and George always used to reflect on this as well. The first time that you, you set up an ad and, and then you run it to your website and you're getting like either sales on Shopify or bookings. And then it becomes real cash in your bank. It becomes this, like, it blows your mind. It's the most addictive thing to realize that, Hey, you don't need to go and trade your time at some big company. There is other ways to make money. And it's powerful. You, you just need to start, right? And then it's like, you know, you can take it to the sky from that point on. But yeah, it's really cool. Particularly to do it with your mom, like a family business to be able to contribute like that would have felt pretty cool. Exactly. Huge impact. So fulfilling. And yeah, a lot of fun. Like to mm. see that it just, it felt like powerful because yeah, it was like, yeah. wow, people are coming into our house and, you know, I don't know, you know, we didn't even do anything and learning all the automations behind that, all the tech, you know, and, and just advancing that. So I was like, cool, lead comes in. I'm going to send them an email. I'm going to set up this flow automatically I'm going to put them into a spreadsheet. I'm going to text my mom so she gets the notification and she can call them and just setting up that whole system behind yeah. it. I was like, wow, that's a, that's real, that's real business. Um, so I delved deeper into digital marketing and then I came across dropshipping 
on YouTube, you know, as every good agency story starts <laughs> yeah. in the dropshipping space. And every e-com story almost yeah. as well. Yeah, literally. And this is like, you know, this is really early days. And that time dropshipping was relatively early. So, you know, I started this watch brand as, as we all do. I think I remember you <laughs> maybe telling us about this very vaguely now that you say it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I started a watch brand. It was like, just like a copy of, you know, Daniel Wellington mm. style or MVMT style watches. Yeah, yeah. Um, setting that up and then. Funnily enough, I, I set up that website and I made it look exactly like the Iconic. And so I actually got sued. Like the Iconic oh, sent me a letter really? and they're no. like, you're using our goodwill to get customers. So I had to take that website oh, down. Um, I started a second website and then it was like, you know, some floral decorations on these watches. And I was like selling these watches around the world. Like some were going to UK, mm. some were going to Hong Kong. Like, you know, it was, it was crazy. And then when, that, when, you, when you see that Shopify thing, you're like, wow, like this is, this is really cool. Um, but it was hard. Like, like having an e-com brand was hard. Like you've got to get inventory, you earn money and you spend it on inventory and you just keep going in that cycle. cycle. You got to deal with suppliers, you got to deal with customers, you know, you got to innovate. And then again, I think I got sued again because some company was like, Hey, you're using our designs. And I was like, this is just for my supplier. I don't <laughs> yeah. even know. Um, that's, a, that's a good, uh, that's a good thumbnail. I got sued by the iconic. No, yeah, yeah literally. They, they wanted a thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. I just took the website down and didn't hear from them after yeah. that. Yeah. So how did you, what did you do to like model it off the iconic thing? Like we just it like. It just looked exactly like them. So the navigation was like black. I think the website was called like something similar as well, like ironic or something <laughs> like that, you know, all the designs were similar. Uh, hey, model what works. That's the, you know, beauty of e-com, yeah? Yeah, exactly. But that was, you know, using my experience and whatever I knew about building websites and, and also early entry into Shopify. Like at that time, Shopify was nothing. It was just starting out. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was the first step into, you know, getting into digital marketing, seeing how sales work, seeing how e-com works. And so when it came time to apply for jobs, I was applying for um, digital marketing roles, even though I had all these, you know, corporate offers. I was like, that's fine. That's there. But this is something that really I'm passionate about. And it makes me excited, yeah. you know, to build something because it fuels that creative side, but also that tech side. Mm. I think that's what you need to be a really strong marketer. You'll have that technical skill set. And in uni, I had learned programming and coding and all that technical aspect. I had learned business as well. So, you know, did like microeconomics, accounting, all these subjects and everything. Plus, I had this creative part of me that I was like, I need to fuel that side. Otherwise, you just kind of feel almost numb, you know, when you don't let that creative juice flow. It feels like from your skill set and your interests, you were kind of built for e-commerce. But yeah, so you had the job offers from the corporate space, but you also were obviously really interested in going and kind of experiencing everything, you know, working at, a, at an agency, you're going to get to be hands-on, you're going to get to be creative, you're going to learn the technical side of things. Financially at the start, was there much of a discrepancy between the two? Were you going to get paid more to be in corporate or was just that's the big safe trajectory that you um, could have went on? Look, I mean, being an Indian, you know, migrant, um, obviously your parents are a pushing to- sort yeah, of company is going to- and, and, you know, go to Big Four, do something, yeah. um, you get a good job, you stay stable. Safe, yeah. Exactly. Um, but, you know, I, I, I discovered the world of digital marketing and I was like, wow, there's all these agencies out there. There's hundreds of them. There's also the Big Four of agency world, you know? Omnicom, IPG, WPP, Dentsu. I can apply to all these guys as well. Um, and I think I applied for maybe a hundred, a hundred different marketing companies in Australia. And only one of them gave me an interview, which That's led to insane. an offer. Like literally just one <laughs> after a hundred applications. Uh, because there's no, the companies are too small to have like grad programs, you know? And so mo a lot of them are looking for someone with experience. Whereas my experience was I did this for my mom. And <laughs> yeah. I built this drop shipping store. I think it's a pretty good, you know? it's pretty good experience in my opinion though. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I've, I've found there's not a lot of um, people don't really like you to pivot. You know, if you're in market, if you're, if I was in IT, which is kind of what I was heading towards or business and analyst consulting type, they were like, how are you coming into marketing? You don't have a qualification. Um, they don't, I mean, passion is not something that sells in the corporate <laughs> yeah, space. In the corporate yeah. Yeah. Just, no, man, I'm really watching a lot of YouTube videos on it. They're like, mate, get out of here. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But luckily the one that did give me an interview, you know, he looked at me, he was like, oh, cool. You've got this experience in PwC Deloitte, mm -hmm. but you're, I can see you're super passionate and I can, you know, and he brought someone technical to test me and all that. And he was like, cool, I can see you can do this. So come on board. Um, and initially he brought me on board as a coordinator. Um, but we were chatting and then I was like, oh, like, you know, I have a bit of sales experience, you know, I, I've sold a uh, massage packages <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah, for wellness. And he's like, okay, well, you know, and, and I also knew a bit of everything. So I knew mm -hmm. SEO, I knew websites, I knew, uh, you know, ads and everything. So he was like, well, it looks like, you know, you're a jack of all trades. Yeah. So you'd be good in sales and I don't have anyone in sales. So I started off in sales. 
Um, sales experience though, for whatever you're going to do in business, whether it's direct sales or just influencing people or communicating your ideas and getting people to understand and be, be on board, people don't realize, but you're always selling in some way, shape or form. And I think like sales can, I've, I spent a, about 18 months in corporate sales as well. And I think it's really great experience. You have to do a lot of, you know, shit jobs that, you know, make you feel uncomfortable. You have to fail way more than you win. But it's a really good foundation, I feel like, if you want to do anything in business, go get a year or two of sales under your belt and it will help you handle everything else that you're going to deal with in the future. Well, that's all business is. It's selling. I mean, even everyday life, you know, even dating, you're, you're selling. Yeah, you're selling yourself 100%. <laughs> it's, all, it's all sales. Uh, and when you can learn that skill, that's good. And my selling style was never like hard selling. You know, it wasn't like, hey, I'm going to get you 10x returns guaranteed. It was always solution-based selling. So what is the problem that you have and how can I actually solve this? And then going really deep, showing technical expertise, showing understanding, building a strategy, and then selling them on that strategy. So I have a lot of times where in my current agency, I've lost a lot of deals because I'm not going to go in and be like, hey, mate, I'm going to set up this campaign guaranteed 10x. Obviously, there's other agencies that do that because that's why I've lost these deals. <laughs> yeah. But I have times where literally they will spend three months with that agency that promised them this and then they'll come back to me and they'll be like, hey, you told me the truth. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. I find that really interesting as well um, about kind of just like ethical business practices. Same thing with e-com as well. You'll have some competitors that go and claim X, Y, Z things, which you know is 100% false, full of shit. Um, and they'll get away with it for an extended period of time. And then it all, it kind of gives them an unfair advantage, but karmically, or just, you know, everything catches up to them. I don't think it's a really good long-term strategy because, you know, they do that to enough people. They leave and go to yourself or another agency, their reputation gets diminished. So it, it can never be a long-term thing. Yeah. Um, and you hear it now with all these agencies that you have, you know, and I'm not going to throw our names, but any big agency with, you know, say 40 plus 50 plus staff that we all know who they are. And mm -hmm. Yes, they have good clients and they have good case studies who they probably dedicate a lot of time to, but then they, you always hear, oh, I, I had this bad experience with them or this bad experience with them. And, you know, I understand you can't have a positive experience with everyone. Yeah. Um, but the problem is there's a misalignment between what was sold and what was actioned. And mm. that's where there's an issue because if, it, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm never selling the fact that, hey, I'm guaranteeing you this. It's, hey, you're investing in this. I'm going to do everything in my power to get you there. This is the plan and I'm going to action it all, but we may or may not get there. And that's, yeah. and I feel like it's weird because I'm, sometimes I'm almost telling the client, I can't work with you, you know, yes. and they still want to work with me because of that. Yeah. I think the agency space has gotten to that point where, um, you know, and, and founders are smart people like e-com brands, e-com space is just tough. Like you cannot absolutely just start a brand now and, and, you know, it's through the roof. There is, it's so much saturation. Consumers are smarter. No one's just clicking an ad and buying. In fact, probably most of the time people are like, I don't know if this is real or not. Yeah. Um, so when the founders are smarter, they need to be sold by smart people. And if you're just selling to them saying, hey, guaranteed, I can do this. So like how? And like set up this new campaign. I can do it. Yeah. You know, it <laughs> yeah. just, it doesn't work like that. For me, the sales pitch is your business has unit economics that need to be adjusted. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a fundamental shift in the way that you're advertising. And here is how we're going to deliver that fundamental shift, whether it's creating a landing page that's going to double your conversion rate whether it's launching a bundle that's going to increase your average order value, mm -hmm. whether it's having a new structure or a new way of producing creatives, you know, maybe you're only running statics. Yeah. That's a fundamental shift in the way you're marketing the business. And that's, what's going to cause you an in increase uh, an improvement in your MER, your blended ROAS, whatever, and your return on spend versus just, Hey, I'm going to set up a new campaign, use whatever you've already got, change nothing. Um, and that, that happens. Just a quick one from me. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you'd know that after scaling Happy Skin Co to over $10 million per year, I spent close to 18 months creating the Viral Brand Builder program which teaches someone with zero experience how to launch and scale their very own e-commerce brand. With over 100 training videos and direct access to me, including one-on-one -on -one calls, you'll be guided throughout the entire process. Now, we already have a bunch of incredible results from students that are making multiple five and six figures per month. So if you want to learn how to build a business that has the potential to completely change your life, then click the link in the description and book in an application call today. Spots are limited as you'll be speaking directly to me. So hopefully I'll chat to some of you soon, but until then, let's get back to the podcast. And the, and the funniest thing as well, like they'll show you a screenshot of this campaign with like 16 ROAS, but it's yeah. like, it's like one little thing where it was all retargeting previous customers. They probably had this ROAS for like a day or two and they lead with that. And you know, some, some, Brands will come to me that I'm that I'm just mentoring in the space. So I chatted to this agency. They reckon they can get me like an eleven ROAS. I'm like, bro, 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, if there's a strategy behind it, sure. Like, hey, we're going to double your conversion rate by doing this. We're going to create new content, which is going to reduce your cost per click, increase your traffic for the same spend, that kind of thing. But if it's literally just like, we're going to set up this special campaign that we've got and that's going to do that, it's not. Our patented processes, yeah, well, they'll yeah. give it some fancy. The, the worst is when the agency is like, you can't have access to the ad account. And that, it almost makes me cry. Well, when I hear some that. agencies even set up the ad account and own it. And then if you want to leave, you don't even get to take your yeah, Because your, there's your like some patented you. process in there. I'm like, what? There is no That's such That's crazy, thing. man. It doesn't make sense to me that a client is paying you money to do something for them and they don't own that. Yeah. So that's where I have absolutely maintained that integrity. Say I'm never owning anything. Yeah. And even after you leave, if you need me to help with something, if you need me to hand over, yep. I'll be there to do that. And mm. I think that has really helped my reputation in the industry. And you'll attract the right type of people. And it's not a short term, okay, I'm going to necessarily explode the business in like a month or two months. But you know, the longer time you've gone on, I look at your website, you're working with more like brands that I know that have been around the Aussie e-com space for a while. And I think it's a good long-term strategy, but on that and kind of the agency piece, we were just chatting off air. I find that really interesting and something really that I really respect and really commendable about you is <clears throat> you've gone on the record and you say, you don't want to grow a massive agency. Talk to me about the thought process behind that and what gave you the clarity and when, when that realization was at the start two years in that you realized that, Hey, this isn't what I want. This is the way I want my life to look. Yeah. I mean, it comes from a lot of places. Like initially when I was looking at businesses, how people are running businesses, also just like, what do you want out of life? Like, do you want something, you know, where you're running it and your profit margin is really thin. And so you're stressed all the time, or do you want like a lifestyle business? So for me, the agency is a lifestyle business. It's not something that I'm like, I'm going to do this for three years and then I'm out, you know, I'm going <laughs> to do a run ourselves for, for millions. Yeah. And, I mean, I get that business model, but for me, this is like, I want to do this for a long time because I'm passionate about what I do. Like I yeah. love working with people like you. I love working with founders. Mm -hmm. I love amplifying my impact on this world. And the way I do that is the founder is making an impact because they have a product that they believe in that should be in everyone's hands. When I'm getting it into those people's hands, I'm amplifying my impact by working with multiple people. Mm -hmm. That's purposeful. That's fulfilling. And that's what I want to do. So, and, and for me, when I looked at business, there was, I, I, I came across business models, which was like, stay small, you know? And obviously a part of it is like, you hear the growth, growth, growth. You watch Alex Homozy, you watch Gary Vee, you get excited, you know, a thousand person agencies. Um, but then the part that was like, what if we don't need to? And it's like, why, why are we actually pushing for growth, growth, growth? And what are you trying to achieve out of that? You know? Um, but for me, I felt I can make a better impact. Um, if I focus on a few set, you know, clients, um, if I help them with the most impact that I can do rather than giving everyone a little bit of impact, I give everyone a lot of impact that I work with. Um, and yes, I, I reach capacity. Like I'm at capacity probably for, you know, nine months out of 12 for the year. And there's three months where I'm doing a little bit of business dev and I'm maybe taking on one client a month at a mm -hmm. time max. Um, so it has its own things, but then at the same time, I feel fulfilled Clients are happy with the work we're delivering. Um, I'm also like very like a perfectionist in a way. So I'm <laughs> like, if we're going to deliver something, it has to be right. I need to yeah. review this start to finish. I, I know every ad that is in every account that we manage, you know, um, I know every strategy for the client. I know what the plan is. I know how their website works. I know every product that they sell sometimes even better than them, um, <laughs> you know, so I pride myself in that. Yeah. Um, and also when I worked at the agency that I was in locally, you know, we were kind of in the growing growth pain stage, maybe 15 staff, but profits were really tight. There was this huge expenses, all this rent. And I saw the stress that, was, that the founder was experiencing. Like we would lose a client and there would be so much stress. Like, how am I going to pay next month's yeah. wages? And I was like, that's just something I don't want. Yeah. And I, I don't see a reason for it. Cause it's like, you know, I guess, um, but then I see some bigger agencies, you know, I, I follow Maxwell Hurton who own, owns Megaphone. Um, and, and I see him like now he's, you know, sold the agency, he's moved on, he's enjoying his life in the U S but he had to do 10 years of, you know, stress, 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 stress before he got to that point. So then there's the other side as well. Um, but you know, I don't know, I'm just happy where I am. And, um, I, I really, um, and we were chatting a little bit off air as well. I think like making big decisions like, you know, which way do you want to take the business? What does growth look like for you? What do you really want? is something that takes a lot of maturity and self-awareness to realize what's important to you because it's so drilled into us, chase the growth, chase the cash, chase the profit. But like you said, business is always going to be a problem solving game. There's always going to be stresses that come along with that. If you can build a really good business and you're making like a good amount of profit where you're extremely comfortable, you love the work you do, like 
don't feel like you have to be pressured to go chase more just because it's what they say in all the books, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I really love that. I've got a lot of respect for that. But talk to me back, just rewind a little bit about the thought process when you went from the agency to starting your own, what was that kind of thought process like? And were you applying for other agency jobs at that point and weighing them up against starting your own thing? What did that process look like? Yeah, look, I think in business, it's always a little bit of luck and a little bit of just being open for opportunity. Um, so in that way, I do believe that you make your own luck because if you're open to opportunity, you will attract what you're looking for. And I know you're, you're all about that as well, manifesting, attracting, yeah. visualizing. So I did, you know, I was at the agency and I was happy there. Um, but I wanted, I think I wanted more. And I also, the founder was working with every client, uh, any type of business. And I had worked with, you know, in the, in the portfolio that I was managing, I had taken on a, a couple of e-commerce clients and we'd scaled them up really strong. And so my thing was, Hey, we need to double down on e-commerce. Mm -hmm. In fact, not just e-commerce, we need to double down on Shopify. And I think for, at that time it was so early, like so early e-com, so early Shopify that he was like, we can't do that. <laughs> like, we, 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 we're not going to get enough clients is Shopify could just die. And then, you know, come three years, Shopify IPOs, huge companies, e-commerce takes off. So I was lucky that I saw what, what I wanted to do, but he wasn't on board with that fully, which was okay. So I moved on. I took a, just a chill client side job at Optus, funnily enough, okay, yeah. um, which is it's still a brand that I'm super passionate about. Yeah. They used to call me the Optus fanboy while I was there. Oh, they were really? like, I love Optus so much. I'm like, I've been a customer for 15 years. Great service. It's awesome. Uh, and that was, you know, it's a whole nother experience. That was Dude, so fun. Steph, who, who you know as well, part of the, our team, she has been with me and supported me through so many issues with Optus, with <laughs> uh, internet in the office, at home, all of the above. So not the yeah, same experience. Not the same experience, but not, nonetheless, I'll take your no, point. But I loved working there. And they've got this great campus in Macquarie Park. Like it's almost like going to university again. So like, <laughs> that was like one of the best years. But that, so I spent 12 months there. And while I was there, I had, um, a little bit of extra time. And I, that's when I started freelancing. Um, so, you know, I, I reached out to a couple of clients. I, I had a few people in my network, like friends of friends of friends who said, Hey, we've, I've got this retail store. So one of them was classic homeware and gifts. I've got eight shops in Sydney, but my online store sales are zero. So I said, okay, let's see what we can do here. So I took that experience at my agency where I had scaled multiple brands up now. Um, I just built his Shopify website from scratch. I set up all his products. I set up his creatives. I set up his ads, Google ads, Facebook ads. And we literally took it from zero to 200 K per month. You know, I did the same thing for a friend of mine who was in Brisbane, um, Oli Joy Sports. They were running gym equipment, full retail store, but they didn't have anything online. So I said, cool, let me take this online. Shopify store, set up all the ads, zero to 150 K per month in two to three months. That's crazy. And when I saw that, I was like, okay, I'm onto something here. Yeah. Um, and word gets around, you know, when you do, when you do good work. So I was able to take those initial case studies and then talk to other people about them. Um, one of them was you, you yeah. know, and I think you saw the work that I was doing yeah. pretty early on. Yeah. So you gave me that opportunity and then George saw the work I was doing, yeah. Yeah. you know? And so he's like, Hey, come with Georgie Maine. Um, and again with George, I was like, you know, it was a very like soft sell. I didn't even sell him at all. It was very much like, Hey, you're the master of ads. Like you ran the ads and yeah. had the skin with, with Dylan. I, what can I even do for you? Yeah. Um, but he was like, nah, look, I just need you to, I need an expert that I can trust yeah. and I'm going to do so much more. I think the trust part is, is really important. If you definitely, if you're going to have that almost like internal feel, like you need to have, and like, same thing. It wouldn't work the way, like sometimes we, we, we have periods where we're meeting every week. Sometimes we're, we have periods where we meet way less. And I wouldn't have the flexibility to go do all the other things I'm doing if I didn't have a person that I could trust in, in that position. Uh, so I think it's really important to choose your partners wisely from both ends, both as a business. Cause you know, I'm sure you would have had, you take on a client and you can kind of sense, Oh, I just sense that they're going to be a, a, a trouble client and create 10 times the work, but you do it anyway yeah. and you regret it. And you just know I should have trusted my instincts. So it works both sides. If something doesn't feel right, like I think like trust your instincts on those ones. What would you think? What do you think? Oh yeah. That's something I've learned. You know, you have, you have <laughs> clients like that and you're right. Like when I take on a client, sometimes I do get that feeling. I'm like, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but you know, okay, we, we have capacity, we can take them on. And then you end up spending so much more time than you should <laughs> yeah. with that client. Um, but I, I will still maintain that, you know, we will still do the best work and we will deliver to the expectations of the client. And if they're not aligned, then, you know, that's up to them. And I never understood contracts like agency contract hey you have to be in a 12 month contract mm. with us because i was like why would you force someone to work with you if they don't want to work with you and trying to get it i've had heaps of conversations people on the pod trying to get out of them 
you know, yeah. brand owners and they're like, mate, you signed the contract. Yeah. You've got six months left, whether you want it or not. It's such and a- And like, they can be quite ruthless. It's like you're married or something and then you're like, no, you can't leave. It's like, wait, oh. what? <laughs> doesn't make sense. So for me, it's always, hey, month to month, you know, you decide if you want to work with me, you know, and if the relationship's working, then you will. Then they'll stay for like many, many years anyway. So exactly. it's like- um, One thing I want to touch on just because before we move into like, like some specific e-com stuff, Facebook ads, those sorts of things. You're, you're a person that, you know, puts a lot of emphasis on like efficiency and process, right? That's how you've been able to do what you've been able to do. In terms of the agency space, obviously a lot of people, I heard a stat, me and you, we were talking about it today. Apparently, I haven't verified this. I don't know if it's right. Apparently there's, there's one agency for every 10 brands in Australia right now. <laughs> yeah. If that's the case, that's mental. But what sort of processes, people, apps, tech, have you been able to use to streamline the agency process? Like, yeah, what have you been able to do to make that easier? Because we talk about lifestyle brands and someone starts an agency and realizes it's not even, it's not easy to start an agency either. What are some of the things you've been able to do to make it streamlined for you? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. There's there's so many agencies and there's so many gurus out there telling everyone to start an agency, which is part of the problem. <laughs> yeah. But Imam Gazi and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, which is okay. It's a good business model. There's no doubt about it. But for me, it's like, well, if if you don't have experience in what you're doing, how do you sell others to do it. I, I don't think that's right. I, I think you need to get into the field, become a master of the art, and then you sell the service. A hundred percent. Which has been happening for hundreds of years for consultants. It's just a consulting business. Agency just means marketing, but it's just consulting. That's what I do. I'm a consultant. I come yeah. in and I'm an expert. I'm a subject matter expert and I help you with it. Um, in terms of tools, like I can't speak for the agencies that do the volume game where you have hundreds of clients. For me, I'm like, you know, my book of clients probably fits in one hand mm -hmm. at a certain point in time. So I don't need a CRM system. I don't need yeah. HubSpot. I'm like, I know all my clients by heart. I can name them all. I have a spreadsheet where I've got a list of all my clients. I've got all their contact details. Yeah. Know, I've got everything I'm doing for them. That's my CRM. That's a Google sheet. Yeah. And it gets updated. It gets removed. There's an archive. I just do it. It doesn't take that long. I mean, and like I said, I'm adding maybe one client a month at peak. Yeah. Otherwise it's just, you know, it's just retaining who I've got. So, you know, that's literally my CRM. And then now Slack. I think is the best tool for managing everything with your, mm. uh, with your agency. You've got, you, you've got obviously community management. All my clients uh, are now getting added into some sort of communication, yeah. you know, whether it's WhatsApp or whether it's Slack, because I realize that I, if, if I'm going to be a part of their business, I, I, they need to have access to me. And that's mm. something I pride myself in. Yeah. I can just, I just message you anytime. Sometimes yeah. 8.30 at night, just, hey, yeah. money, you got this. And so. I'm here, right? Because yeah. that's the way, and I'm like, I th and that's probably a part of me that's been drilled in me because of that migrant mentality where it's like, we're hustlers. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't care if you're messaging me at midnight. I will respond. You're paying me. You deserve to get a response. Yeah. For me, flexibility is really important in the people I work with and the partners I work with, right? Yeah. Flexibility and, and understanding. And because otherwise it's like, yeah, you, regardless what business model you're in, you put a lot on the line to be in business. You're risking a lot. You're, you got to hunt for yourself. You got to bring in the money. If you're going to make all these sacrifices and deal with all this extra stress, why don't we build the business around your lifestyle somewhat? So you get some benefits attached to that as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think reliability and communication are probably like the two key things, like 50% of running an agency or like running a consulting business. Say like if you're reliable, uh, which means, you know, you say something, you do something. You know, mm. I will follow up on what, if you tell me something, you're not going to have to tell me to do it again. It will be done. You know, and that's something that I'm like, it has to be that way. You know what burns me? And I've spoken about this before, but you, you'd, you'd be someone who knows exactly like this, but from a competitor's la landscape, uh, because of the rise of like, you know, the Iman Gadi stuff, which he's killing it, like no disrespect on him, but that whole, and there's, he's not the only one. There's many people talk about it. Okay. Starting like, who was, who was one? What's his name? Um, don't worry, I forget his name. I can picture his face. American dude, something. He's got like fine cash in his name or anyway. No, it's on the tip of my tongue, but we'll move on. So they say, okay, start an agency. You don't need the skills because all you do is sell it. Then you go on to Fiverr and you find someone that can do ad creative here and run your ads here and you, you give them the stuff and then you report it to the customers. I'm like, dude, if I found out someone did a mad pitch on me, mad salesperson. Yeah, we're going to do all this. And then he's just going to random people on Fiverr or Upwork to do it that, you know, I don't know. I don't necessarily trust and I've got access to my account and my business. Yeah. I would be filthy. Yeah. Which, I mean, that's probably how all of these agencies start. So right many now. of them. Because so many of them. That's the thing. And and I've been listening to some good agency founders. So there's an agency in the UK called Genflow. Jason Capital. Jason that Capital. guy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> something cash in his name. Anyway, not important. Um, but Genflow, 
mm -hmm. this guy runs like a hundred million dollar agency in the UK. And his thing is like, the founder has to be the best at everything in the agency, like skill set wise. If you're going to launch a new service offering, you as the founder are responsible for delivering that. So yeah. you need to know everything about it. So he was like, he runs a hundred million agency, but he's like, we're launching TikTok shop as a service. I went in TikTok. I created a TikTok shop. I communicated with creators. I did the first campaign. And that's very much my mindset as well. Mm. And I've been very slow and thorough with the services that I've released. So when I started, yes, Facebook ads, the only service that I worked on because that was all I was the best at, that I wanted to be the best at. Then we slowly did web development. Okay, I'm like, clients are not able to do their website work. They don't, finding a Shopify developer seems to be so hard. <laughs> a reliable one. It's yeah. easy to find them. And Shopify didn't make it easy because they made a whole new language for their system. So they weren't <laughs> like, well, it's not HTML, it's not JavaScript, this is like liquid. We've yeah. got our own language. So I found a really good developer who's now in my team full time. And I'm like, yeah. let me help the clients with this. Let me just get it done. Um, and then this is my third pillar. So reliability and communication. The third pillar is proactivity. Mm. You have to be proactive to be, to have a successful, like, you know, client relationship. Um, and that's something that I think has really helped me with retention. When a client, when I tell a client, Hey, we're going to work on this. And then I follow up with them. I follow up with them and I get it done. And they see me through to the end that, Hey, this guy, like, I didn't even ask him, but he just got it done. It's part of reliability, but it's also just taking action. Like mm. if the client's like, you know, I kind of think we should do this. I'm like, hey, I'm going to do it for you. Yeah. A lot, you know? a lot of agencies, you have, have a good idea. We'll say, we'll do this. And they'll just wait around for months and months it. and months. Yeah. For like, Hey, to... can you send me this creative? Like just crop it from the website, you know, <laughs> yeah. just get the screenshot yourself. Just like, Hey, can you send me like remove this text? Just do it yourself. Yeah. You know? And that's something I think it's like, you need to be proactive. You need to show them that you really care. hundred percent. And I, I'm able to treat every client's business like my own because I don't go for this volume game and have hundreds of clients. It's like, I've got a set of clients that I work with. I consider this my business. What would mm. I need to do today to get this to the next level? And then I tell them and then I implement that. Um, and I think that's probably, again, one thing that's helped me with retention, just implement it. Yep. Uh, a lot of agents are like, yeah, we do CRO. And they're like, hey, you should change this button. The client's like, okay, it'll take them six months to get that done. Where are they going to find a developer? How are they going to get the time to do this? Just do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and this is where I'm like, hey, I want to change this on the website. Can I just do it? Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then I, I think I that adds done. so much value to the brand's perspective as well, particularly like if you're, Obviously, sometimes you're going to be working with marketing managers. Sometimes you'll be on with the founder as well. Like, but regardless, people are busy. If you've got like, a, a, like something like that, that it will take you 10 minutes, but it will take the business two weeks to figure out. Yeah. If you can just go and, hey, I think this could benefit the business. Can I go and action this? I think it's, you're going to, it's going to be doing a lot of favors to, to, to the people you're working with. So I really appreciate that. Um, now let's talk about for the econ people listening, still a bit of a deep dive talking about some of the, the major skill sets that you work on. Obviously Facebook ads, it's kind of been the, the most important advertising channel for the last 10 years, still is to today, um, but it changes all the time, yes. right? What's, you know, we're late 2024, com coming into Black Friday very, very soon. So we'll talk about what brands can be doing to prepare to have the best Black Friday ever in a second. But just in terms of like Facebook, now I've got a bunch of like more specific questions, but before I lead you to, to down any like rabbit hole with that, where would you start? with if you're going to try and explain how a brand an econ brand that you know is running their own ads a bit of a startup or someone even if they're doing say six figures a month that are trying to scale where would you get them to start like what are the focuses what are some of the best practices that you think econ brands running on facebook running ads on facebook which obviously meta facebook and instagram um need to understand to to get the best out of their account yeah so i mean there's so many things mm -hmm. from a brand landscape firstly like with a brand you you need to have validation really before you run ads. A lot of the times you we will have, I'll have a startup brand and like, Hey, can we start running ads? I'm like, you can, but it's very hard to be profitable from day one. Like, even if you just look at the numbers, it's like $1 to get a click 2% conversion rate. You know, that's $50 to acquire a customer and your product is what $90 and mm. uh, you know, cost of goods is 40. You're, you're left with nothing, you know? So you need validation before you even start anything. But for brands that are, you know, already there, they're already running their ads. They've got some sort of traction. What do we do? Um, I think it, and, and, and I think we, we discussed this earlier as well, it comes down to the content. How can we set up ads and content and have a system that is going to allow us to keep creating different variety of content very fast, very rapidly. And this is something that I've been talking to Meta about. And, you know, every time we go to their office, they push the concept of creative diversity. It's taking me a while to understand like, what the hell does that even mean? Creative diversity. Okay, great. So I set up a couple of videos and graphics. Like creative diversity is about, because there's really no more targeting anymore. And I think 
iOS 14 came in and there was this whole shift and everyone was talking about it and it was this buzz thing. It was like, wow, it's going to kill advertising. And then it came in and everyone kind of forgotten about it, mm. but it's still there. Meta actually doesn't know who their audience is anymore. They don't know what people are searching for. They don't know, you know, so it's all based on what is your ad saying? And we're going to find people that are going to respond to that ad and they're going to resonate with that ad. So when you look at creative diversity, yes, one is a mix of ad types. You need statics, you need videos, you need GIFs, you need animations, you need the ad types, you need story, you need feed placements. Um, the other side is the creative diversity in itself in terms of what is the asset showing you. So you need to have, you know, gen lifestyle content. You need to have user generated content. You need to have professional content. You need to have just promotional content, product based content. Um, but then uh, on the other tier to that is the messaging behind it. Each asset that you have now needs its own different messaging. So who is, you're going to have content for men. You're going to have content for women. Are you going to have content for certain age groups? And then within that, different messages for each of those demographics. So you might have men that, you know, you're trying to target that I have a certain experience in their life, or you might have some that are, that have a certain problem that you're trying to solve. And there might be multiple problems that you can solve for that different specific demographic. So really you need to create like a 3d vision in your, in your mind in terms of what is a demographic for that demographic, what is the messaging angle? Mm -hmm. And then within that, how can we create all the different ad types? Yeah. To, to do that. And that is what a really successful account looks like. So with that process, right? Like if someone's listening to that, I think you did a really good explanation. Say we're going into Black Friday soon. If someone wants to create a whole new batch of content, taking those principles forward, that's great, right? How much content, and I know it's definitely going to depend on the amount of budget they're spending. But if you can like say, let's just say someone said, Manu, I'm going to start working with you next month. Here's 30 pieces of creative, you know, mixture of video and statics. And you, we've ticked all those boxes. We, we, we all know today, as you said, there's hardly anything like there's hardly any targeting on Facebook anymore. It's all about the creative. Now, some, some people still, you know, have some segmentation out there and some audiences they create, which we'll talk about in the sec, but content really is the be on end all. You work with brands like smaller, well, not small brands, but smaller brands and brands, as I said, doing 3 million a month. What's the best, you know, tip or advice or process that you see brands make because content is consistent content creation and production is one of the biggest challenges that I see like big, bigger brands that I'm, I'm friends with or the brands that I'm mentoring, you know, in the startup e-com space is like, yeah, sweet. Like I get it. You keep telling me content, but it takes time. It's hard to understand. Do you have any advice on how brands can consistently bring in the right types of content to test and then be able to scale from those tests? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's just about having a process and a system in place and usually having someone that owns it. So if mm. there are a few brands that we own that process for them now, which yep. is a service that we've started saying, Hey, cool, we are going to strategize on the different statics and we're going to strategize on the different, in different videos. Sometimes they'll give us the footage. Sometimes we'll go and we'll find the footage for them. Um, it's just about alignment, but it's just creating a system. So for example, we have a client who says, cool with the statics, I'm going to give you the photos. You figure out the messaging. So then I've got a creative strategy on my team who I'm going to say, Hey, here's the brand. Uh, they'll, the brand will give us a messaging matrix. So they will say, and this is something I recommend every brand does to create a messaging matrix, which basically means here's our product. Here's who we're targeting. Here's the problem we're solving. And here's the benefits that you get out of our product. And you do that for every different product that you have, every demographic that you want to target. And then you give that to the creative strategist who will look at that to say, Hey, here is uh, you know, here's messaging. They're going to be a copywriter. So they're going to say, here's the different creatives. They will brief the graphic designer. And then you have the graphic designer who will create the statics. Same thing with video content. You get the footage, create the messaging. Um, with video content as well, you want to have a team of ambassadors that you work with. So you want to have 10 to 15 creators that you just know produce good content and understand your brand. And, you know, every month, every two months, you're engaging with these creators to consistently get content. So what on those types of content, obviously video has been rammed down people's throat the last couple of years. What sort of content, whether it be video, but like specifically what sort of video is it UGC? Is it really raw content? Like what's the type of content now? And I know you people can ask you this all the time and you know everyone just wants to know the gold, the gold nugget of like, I'm just going to do that and it's going to kill it. I don't obviously can be really different depending on different businesses, but overall what's the main sort of content if a brand could nail for their paid ads, what would you think that would be? I would say it's a form of edutainment content. So it's educational and entertaining at the same time. So this is a type of content that not only does it go viral on Instagram or TikTok, it also drives sales mm. because you have content that's entertainment. 
this is some meme or something, something hilarious, you know, you know, what's that brother, that kind of thing. It'll go viral, right? Um, and it'll do really well, yeah. but it's not going to make sales, right? Then you've got the completely educational content, which probably won't go viral. And it's like super educational, but it's just education. A little bit more boring. Unless people are really interested in it, yeah. they're not going to watch yeah. long of it. But if you as a brand can conceptualize and find a balance between that where it's educational and entertainment, that's where you've got a perfect mix. Yui, that's what, that's what they've done. Have you, did you speak to him off air about their brand, uh, Ali Bottle? That's yeah, what they've yeah. done really well. It's like yeah. the personality behind it as well. Like we're seeing the rise of like founders being in the content yes. and putting their personality. That's a really good way to be able to do that. Are you still seeing in, the, in terms of the paid mechanism for you, founder-based content and ads performing well? Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, like a brand that has a personal brand behind it from a founder or some sort of celebrity endorsement is almost like guaranteed success. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, you know, I've got a brand where the founder talks about skincare and he's got a personal personal brand just around skincare and he does promotions for other brands, but then he's released his own skincare line as well. And that is like, you know, that's just formula for success because yeah. not only do you build trust with that community, but now you've got your own product that's you know, backed by you as well. And you're happy to be the face of that brand. There's no reason why, you know, people don't buy it. So ads is becoming more complex and you need to figure out how to simplify it. And to simplify it, it's actually that people, ideally, they shouldn't enter your funnel from the ad. It shouldn't be the first time they hear about your product. They should have seen it somewhere else. Brand awareness has a very close correlation with your conversion rate through ads. And this is a study that TikTok recently shared with me where they literally looked at if we run brand awareness style um, content or, or, or promotions or, you know, advertising, what does that do to your conversion campaigns? And it just, it increases your conversion rate. And that's, I mean, that's natural when you think about it. You're like, obviously, sure. obviously if you, if a brand is well-known, it's going to convert better with ads. Do you then, um, do you then obviously, cause a lot of people we speak to like, you know, 90% of the time, at least we're running conversion objectives. Do you, for many of your brands, run genuine brand awareness campaigns or are they always let's do brand awareness style content, but still, you know, target like conversions. Oh yeah, absolutely. Brand awareness campaigns. Like it, it is something that you get to a certain point before you do. So you're probably looking at become, being a seven figure brand when you get to that point. Um, you want to have some sort of brand activity running because especially if you're only targeting like Australia, for example, it's actually not hard to just saturate the whole Australian audience. Like you can probably spend like, you know, a hundred K and you can probably reach half the population of Australia. So after that point, it's like, well, these people haven't bought. Um, Particularly where I think, sorry to cut you off, where, where brand awareness campaigns work really well in conjunction and are really a, a, an investment in the brand long-term as well as lifting immediate conversions is when you have a consumable product that is built off repeat purchases, because yep. sometimes a brand awareness, all you need to do is put that, you know, idea front of mind of them. And that can be enough to trigger like a conversion two days later, a day later, next time they walk in and, you know, it might be an omni-channel brand and they go into Priceline and like, oh yeah, yep. I need more of this. Yeah, we have, I have run campaigns. So, you know, I work with EHP Labs and we have run some crazy campaigns where they will launch into every retailer in the world, not just Australia. Like they'll go Walmart, 7-Eleven, you know, every, every Woolworths calling like, hey, we're going to pump brand campaigns on, on TikTok. We're going to bump, bump, pump the campaigns into Facebook. And then they have become, you know, the best selling drink in the country mm. and you know, obviously I can't attribute it directly to the campaign, but there is impact there for sure. You know, and, but then the efficiency of creative from that type of brand is insane. Like within you know three days, they will have 50 creators that have walked into Seven Eleven and created content. And that's the content that we're, we're pushing in brand campaigns, in video view and reach campaigns and reaching as much of the population as we can. Um, and yeah, there is a correlation between that and, and retail sales. Is that and something I wanted to ask you about specifically for, for Happy Skin Care? We'll talk about it more, more off air, but running, like we've got some big things happening in the US early next year and or all throughout next year. Do you ever run like set up? And I've, I've, I've worked with brands that do this really successfully. They would have brand like an ad that they run to their own website for whatever reason, conversions really low, say 1%. They run the same ad. Um, but they put the big retailer branding on it and run it to theirs. And it's like a 10% conversion rate on that. Do you, with any of your brands ever, you know, that are in say Priceline and you want to make sure you have a really good impact. So they impress the, the retailer, grow their store count, run ads to the retailer site. So you're always driving back to the brand's own website. I think, yeah, I think you definitely drive sales for retail. And a lot of that comes from showing people that we're in stores, mm -hmm. you know, creating the content, even things like Amazon. 
the thing is we're just a little bit behind because we can't track it. And if yeah. we could, when we get to the point where we do track it, and they, they, this is happening in like Asia. So we have a brand that is in say uh, at a retailer in Singapore, like Lazada, and they give you integration to their website through a partner pixel. And Meta has the functionality to do this. So if Priceline came to you and said, hey, you can track sales, Meta has the functionality on that. They're just not doing it right now. When we get to that point, I mean, that's going to go off. If you can yeah. send traffic to Priceline or Woolies or Coles and you can track conversion, then, you know, you're at a new point. So at the moment, you're kind of confined to reach campaigns, video view campaigns, mm -hmm. uh, some sort of engagement. Like, hey, you know, comment your local Walmart below and, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and that way you've, you've created an engagement with a customer who now not only do they know that you're in Walmart, they know that they're going to go to their local Walmart and probably, you know, see you there. And that's going to, that's going to have some sort of impact on their subconscious. But yeah, I think, I think we're a little bit far away from running conversion campaigns, but we're close. Yeah. Now in, to, to rewind a bit to what we're talking about, obviously the creative piece, we spent a lot of time on that because it is like the most important part apart from the product of a successful, you know, digital marketing campaign. Right. So it's particularly on Facebook that edu What's the Edutainment. word? Edutainment. Edutainment. The great word. It makes so much sense for people that are going to start running video content on that. Like what is a good, you know, formula for a really effective ad? Now, obviously there's no guarantees anything will work, but more often than not, what's the formula of a, of a winning ad that you see? Like it's really going to depend on what product you're selling. Um, the products that lend themselves really well is something that you can demonstrate. Um, something that you can show some sort of transformation. So this could be something simple where it's a before and after of, you know, hey, hey here's my hair, <laughs> you know, look my hair before, look mm -hmm. my hair after, or here's, you know, here's my eyelashes before and here's it after. Um, obviously there's some restriction around before and after, so you can't really do things. They're like, a lot less strict on that these days, man. Yeah, <laughs> they, they let it through. If, if you have enough spend then especially, <laughs> then, then, <laughs> meta especially, um, TikTok I found is quite strict, but really? they're opening up as well. And even snap is strict, but meta is, yeah, they're just, you can, you can say a lot on meta and they'll let it slide. Um, but yeah, some sort of transformation you want to show. And within the first like four to five seconds, cause that once you get people with that first four to five seconds, you have a much higher rate of, mm -hmm. of, of sticking them around, but you can't just give them something random. So, you know, we've had ads that will, you know, a client will say, well, what about testing? Like, and there's these funny hooks where people like do transitional it. Someone hooks falls and over yeah. and then you transition into this, this creative. And I'm like, that's, that's okay. But I, I, I don't know if that's really focused on conversion. Have you used those before? Yeah. How yeah, do they work? Absolutely. Hit and miss or? Yeah, it's very hit and miss. And I, I wouldn't say they're any of our top performing ads. Mm. Usually the transformation comes directly from the product. You're saying, Hey, wow, you put something on it. Like, Oh my God, that is amazing. And then you go into, so this is this. And then you, you know, you talk about so that. like the reaction yeah. as the hook yeah. as well can be in exactly. a the reaction hook. of to the transformation, you know, mm. um, starting off with that. And then you have to, you've got probably about, you know, 15 to 30 seconds to explain the product, explain the problem, how it solves it. Um, but I'm also a big believer now that the ad is not going to do all the selling. The ad is there to build curiosity. At the end of the day, the ad is there to get them to your website. And that's where, you know, the latest service that now we do is landing pages. And it's so important. And this is something that I saw in the US. Because when you look at the ad libraries of the top brands in the US, I'm like, they're all running to landing pages. No one runs, uh, you know, at, you look at Obvi, these, you know, these guys are genius marketers who've released this huge brand and they're all going to landing pages. You know, look at like Kachava, you look at, you know, um, the, the mind supplement thing. And then you're like, they're all just going to landing pages, but in Australia, no one's going to landing it's pages. It's just starting, right? Yeah. It's just so I, starting. I feel like we were behind there. And, and, and this also, this is the, the, I don't know, fourth pillar of running an agency, which is to keep evolving. Mm. You cannot just have one service forever. You have to evolve the service. And so I have kept myself really open to what is next. What is the next thing I need to do to get my clients results and to get them ahead. And so that's where I was like, and it makes so much sense. Cause you're like, okay, you, you, you can't, the perfect ad will sell the product. No doubt you put someone in the mindset, they'll go to the product page. They probably won't even care, but it's so hard to create the perfect ad now because we don't know who the customers are anymore. But if we create curiosity and we send them to the perfect landing page, you're so much more likely to, to get them to, to sell. How, if you understand a brand and the product and the, and the messaging, how long does it take you and your team to put together a landing page? Um, well, for the initial landing page, it might take you four weeks because you're doing one week of just a lot of research, writing the copy, briefing the designer, and then the development. Once we've developed one, you can kind of duplicate that and yeah. get it done one to two weeks faster. 
Um, but I think it's something that you need to take your time with. And it's usually we wouldn't do it straight from the get go. You know, we'll understand the brand first, run a few ads to the product page, maybe collection page, understand how it performs, figure out what products work best, figure out what messaging works best. And then you go ahead and you create a really strong landing page, um, which again, it's not going to, you know, be an absolute, you know, something that's going to quadruple your sales overnight. It's never like that. It's still an incremental increase. So you know, 20, 30, 40% increase, but that is enough to, you know, really be able to the difference. What sort of brands do you see or sort of like brand slash products do you see landing pages working well? Obviously you're the digital marketing expert, not me. I've spent a lot of my career around this space, but for me, from my understanding, like I think that would work really good for a product like Happy Skin Co. Higher price point. It's, you know, it's really one product, different variations, and we can go into it. But for something like say a, a cheaper $30 skincare product that, you know, they're buying the brand, they're going back once a month or, you know, once every two months. I feel like maybe intuitively, I feel like that won't be the right fit, but what, what do you, what, what, what would you say about that? What sort of products and brands do you think would really get the best out of a, a landing page? Um, yeah, no, it depends. And sometimes, you know, your product page can kind of become a hybrid landing page where you've got a longer form page and you're taking someone through everything, but really it's anything where you would think that you'd go into a store and you need to ask questions or you need to check the back of the box because you can't do that. On, on, on a website, on a product page, you know, you, if you have questions, it, it needs to be answered. Um, also, it's just crafting a better user experience and journey for the customer, which is not only is it part of the process of convincing them and taking them from attention to desire, but it's also just more credibility as a brand. Like, hey, these guys have invested time. Um, also, if you have more credibility to build, like, hey, look at all these articles that we've been in, look at this, you know, TV that we were on, or look at these, these retailers that we're in, that builds a lot of credibility. So the landing page just allows you, it's kind of just a hybrid of all pages on your website. Um, and it should be that one page they land on. They don't need to go on any go other page on your else, website. Right. They don't have any questions in their mind because if they have a single question in their mind, they're not going to purchase. They'll just, you know, and, and, and this is also another thing with e-com now where it's like, how do you, and the kind of sideways into just building a successful brand, you can't just sell whatever anymore right you can't just go to some supplier have some sort of product and, and you sold it. it yeah whatever you sell needs to be innovative it needs to be inventive it needs to be something new and something fresh and if it's something new and fresh then there's people probably have questions about it and that's going to lend itself to a nice landing page where they can get all the information they need one of the one of, one of the brands you work with uh and the founders that i see you know really leaning into the innovation product creation really well is iris with quick flick right like yeah. all her stuff is everything she's trying to do is completely innovative. Like she's not just trying to, okay, let me private label this random thing. She's like, fuck, how do I actually create something new? Um, it seems like a brand has been you're doing quite well off the back of that kind of shift in focus the last year or two. This is from outside looking in. I'm not best yeah, mates with her yeah. anything, but would you agree? Yeah. I mean, Iris is awesome. Like she's, she's an absolute inventor, um, yeah. you know, building, building products and something new every time. Um, but I think a lot of that success now is in retail. And this is another thing which beauty has become quite tough online. Uh, it is a saturated space. Like how many moisturizers can you really buy? <laughs> you know, how much skincare products can you buy? The, the makeup space specifically as well is almost like people want that in-store experience. They want to go into Mecca or Sephora. They want to get it demonstrated. They want to match to their skin tone. You know, they want to see what it looks like, what it feels like. Um, it's such a product that you need to touch and feel. Um, and that's where, again, that's really going to lend itself to something like a landing page. The, the smart retailers as well, some of the people we're talking to, the, bi the biggest big retailers in the US are redesigning all their stores next year or like not all their stores, but close to a thousand to have touch and feel sections of their, of their store as well. So you can fully get that experience. So I think that obviously the rise of e-com and the COVID boom that would everyone, everything, everyone at e-com, but there's so many things about the human experience that we feel a lot more comfortable if we can look and touch and feel and have all our, all our questions answered. This is the thing, like retail, everyone kind of like in the e-com space, you're kind of sheltered and you're in this little bubble and you're like, e-com is everything. <laughs> yeah, when you look yeah, at yeah. it, you're like, no, 95% of people buying stuff is still, still retail. You know, so when brands ask me like, should we go into retail? I'm like, well, yes, if they'll take you and you'll do well, you should go into retail. Sure. But if they'll take you and you won't do well, you shouldn't because you get one shot. <laughs> you know, Woolworths is not going to put you on their shelves again if you fail. Yeah. So yeah, this is something I'm seeing. So a lot of the brands that I'm working with now have a retail presence just because when you have a retail presence, you have generally a successful e-com presence as well. And they are both going to support each other. What do you find goes into, cause obviously you work, you work with the founders of these businesses pretty closely. What do you find goes into exactly what you just said, having a successful launch into a retailer? What are the elements that are involved that generally sees a brand translate e-com success to in-store retail success? 
I'll be honest, in-store retail for me has been a mystery for a long time because I'm like, how do you just go on a shelf and then people just know that you exist and choose to buy you? Um, but no, I'm starting to see the, the success and the elements that come from it. A lot of it is, a part of it is educating the actual retailer about the product so that they sell it. And this is something that Iris is really good at because you'll see her videos on social. She goes into Priceline. She explains a product to the staff of Priceline. Yeah. And the staff get passionate about it. And so when someone goes into the store and they say, hey, what's the best eyeliner? What do you think they're going to say? You know, so the staff is directing people to that. Um, organic content or organic following actually has a really big pull on retail, which it surprised me a little bit because I thought the customer base would be different. Like if you're on social media, can you really get, you know, like, oh, I, I kind of, can you get a desire to buy something just by looking at a video? The answer is yes. I can confirm <laughs> that you, it is yes. Oh, it's definitely yes. Um, organic content has a lot of retail pull. If you can go viral and, you know, show that you're in chemist warehouse and people start going in there and asking about you, that's a lot of it comes from that. Um, and at the end of the day, it's just having a good product and the word of mouth, you know, like, Hey, where did you buy this product? Yeah. Just go into Woolies. Agreed. Um, now I wanted to ask you something else about the creative process. You were mentioned, you know, part of your briefing process, then you give it to one of your copy routers. Now copy is very different brand to brand. But do you have any overarching styles of copywriting, short form, long form, very sales driven, very direct or more, you know, watered down, more brand tone? What generally do you see work quite well in terms of like conversion objective, driving sales in an e-commerce landscape? Well, I think, you know, there's, there's both aspects of it. There is the brand aspect of it. And that's where you have to be careful. You have to have a tone of voice. You don't want to become a discount brand. And some of these brands have done that really well. You know, a brand like July, for example, you, you don't really see it on discount that often, but they sell a lot of luggage and it's a high ticket product, you know, but when you go on their website, I'm almost like, yeah, this experience is not great. It's not selling me anything, but it's just the product looks amazing. Mm. And so you have that, but then you have the direct response aspect where yes, you do need that strong sales copy. I think it depends on what stage you're at as a brand. You know, if you're a younger brand, you probably have less to lose. You know, this is probably more like a 500K per month problem when you're thinking about what, what do people think when they see my brand? It's like yeah. right now people just need to see your brand. <laughs> yeah. you know, this is kind of like the founder's mindset sometimes mm -hmm. needs to change as well, where it's like, they're like so particular about what is said about their brand, what the ad is. Now. It's like, no, this person has used this product slightly wrong. You know, we can't put it in the ad and they're very particular about that, which is, I understand. But at the same time, it's like, this is a six figure problem. We're still, I, you know. I, I agree. Like I worked for my time um, before starting Happy Skin. Um, I worked in, it was, a, it was a hybrid sales marketing role. Um, but like we did a lot of education on like, you know, business uh, and branding and, and everything. And like, I feel like. I, I agree with what you said and I'm on the founder side. I'm on the brand, brand side, but too many times I have conversations with brands doing sub 10 K a month or 20 K a month. And like, cause I hear, no, I can't discount or I got to look after my brand. It's like, you won't have a brand to look after. If first and foremost, you can't make sales. Yeah. Let's get some sales in the brand and then decide, okay, when do we push and pull some bigger promotions, some smaller promotions, some going up to full price. Um, particularly you need to be considerate of that if you're a repeat purchase brand or a clothing brand or something like that. But for a lot of the like gadgety brands or, you know, the innovative products that come out, like you want to acquire market share before your competitors do. So let's be quite aggressive with that. So I think an, a, a balanced approach to looking after the brand, but also like let's sell the fucking product at the same time. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And that's where I think, yeah. So the landing page copy it needs to pull into people's emotions. You need to be like, what is the problem that they have? But also what is the, you know, what do they believe? What do they want to aspire to? Yes, you want to get rid of acne, but why? You know, why? If you can, if you can reach into that emotion, then you have a really good shot at convincing them. Um, and then you combine that with a bit of credibility, like, hey, look at us on this. We're in this retailer or we're in this video or, you know, here's something really expert, really professional. Plus every question is answered. You know how to use the product. You know what's in the product. You know that it's going to be good for you. You've seen all the reviews. You know, there's no question. Then you will be successful. <laughs> um. This is, I'm loving all this stuff to, to get the chat with you about this, but something we haven't spent too much time on apart from TikTok um, is some of those secondary advertising channels, like TikTok, Pinterest, Snapchat. At what stage of the business life cycle do you think is the right time to start testing these other sorts of platforms? TikTok obviously can be great from the start. Um, obviously in an organic sense, when TikTok shop finally comes to Australia, yeah. that will be great. Um, a lot of brands in the US and the UK and parts of Asia have essentially built a brand off one channel, organic TikTok and TikTok shop. That'll come to Australia eventually. 
But when do you see the right time for brands to pull the trigger on? Okay, say they're doing quite decent in terms of their yeah, their, their meta ads and they've got a bit of an organic presence and they're starting to grow. When do you think is the right time to start looking at some of these secondary channels? I think secondary channels is always good. I mean, you know, it could be as early as spending 500 per month or uh, sorry, 500 per day or a thousand per day. Once you're at that point, you know, allocating 5% to Snapchat, 5% to Pinterest, it's going to be a good support. And we do see direct conversion from these platforms and they're actually very keen platforms as well. So we work with Snap and, you know, they're giving us coupons. Here's 5K, just do a test, see what happens. Yeah. You know, they're trying to improve their platforms. I guess you have to remember that, you know, Meta as a platform has been around for like 10 plus years. So it's a very mature algorithm. It's a platform, but these guys are like, they're startups. Mm. You know, Snap is still figuring out, like, I think just last year they've released, okay, you can click an ad and it opens into an external browser or, hey, we've got seven day one, seven day click, one day view now. You know, so the attribution of these platforms, it's not as strong. But, you know, that's where you've got an opportunity. Snap has a lot of inventory right now. There's not, I don't know a lot of people that use Snap personally. And so it feels like, well, who's still using Same. it? Same, I haven't used Snapchat for but seven years, But they have a lot of inventory, like millions of people still Every using day. Snap, still very strong. What are the it. demographics on Snap in Australia anyway? Everyone is using every platform. There's no more demographics. You know, when, when you're saying like TikTok is young, I'm like, nope, I'm selling to 60 year olds on TikTok. They're yeah, not young interesting. anymore. Everyone is on every platform now, you know? Um, and yeah, some people might be more comfortable in certain ones, but no, it's it's not like that. And the more you expand, you create that omni-channel experience. Mm -hmm. People need to see you like 10 times anyway. And if you can show up, then that's going to create that affinity. Snap and TikTok make, um, make sense. They're pretty easy to understand for users, but something that's a little bit more, you know, you see it brought up less and less, but I've heard, I've never, I think maybe back in the day, we might've tried it very you know, Chuck 20K at it and not really put too much effort into it back in the day when we had one of our marketing managers running it. Um, but I have heard from a couple different people that, dude, we're killing it on Pinterest. Like you need to get on the Pinterest. Talk to me about the Pinterest platform and it's it kind of starting to have a little bit of a resurgence in terms of popularity among like e-com brands. Yeah, I think, again, it's, it's part of the omnichannel experience. It's part of people's earlier research stage as well, which makes it, which makes it a good platform. Whereas Snap, and TikTok and probably Meta to a degree is more like bottom of funnel, I'm ready to buy. Whereas Pinterest is, you know, for certain brands like home decor, that kind of thing, uh, you know, or for baby products, people are looking for inspiration. It can come in at an early brand awareness stage. And so if you have a strong, which brings us to a topic of attribution tracking, if you have a strong solution to tell you what was the actual first click that ever brought someone to my website and you can track that back, you might often find that, yes, Pinterest was you know, one of the first. And we have brands that we run Pinterest ad for. And from the technical perspective, it is a similar channel to run ads for from other platforms, but the way that their interface works and where it is in the customer's life cycle is, is a lot earlier. So what sort of brands do you see right now doing well on Pinterest? And is it static picture ads? Because I believe they also have video ads on the platform yep. now as well, Everything, right? yeah. Yeah, so anything that needs inspiration, you know, anything that's in the home decor space, anything that's in the baby product space, uh, fashion brands, when you're looking for, you know, outfit of the day, you know, what to wear. Um, yeah. Any, anything that like definitely, uh, you know, a lot of women getting inspiration from Pinterest or anything that's targeting the female cohort, uh, really strong on Pinterest. Um, so yeah. And, and all, all ad types work now. So videos, you know, vertical videos, uh, you've got your statics as well. You've got animations, everything. You mentioned attribution, uh, attribution tracking. Let's talk about that. Obviously you, you, you briefly mentioned before in the podcast, the iOS 14 changes and everyone lost their mind. There are tools now that can, you know, give you better visibility and tracking and feed that information back into the, the platforms themselves. What te like tools or, you know, applications do have you used? There's a couple that I know you you've used in the past that you think could be really valuable for e-commerce brands to look into. Yep. So with attribution tracking, yeah, you've got the issue where firstly, you know, Meta is no longer able to track people outside of Meta. So when you used to go on a website and get an ad immediately, it, it probably still happens, but it happens less because yeah, a lot of people have opted out of that tracking. So whatever Meta can do now is in platform. So they know that, you know, the reason that the, the algorithm now is all creative based is because if you have a certain creative, Meta figures out who's responding to that. Then it figures out who are similar people that are responding to similar ads. And then it targets those people, but it's all in inside of what people are doing in Meta. With attribution tracking, what's happening, another thing that's happening is, is the one is people are opting out. The second thing is the, the cookies, browser cookies are expired after seven days. So if someone comes onto your website and they come onto your website uh, after seven days and make a purchase, Meta has no idea who paid. 
just or the fact that they sent them to that website. That pixel tracking is lost. So a lot of the tools that you see now are, uh, and they're all about the cookie list future. That's what they're about. They're about replacing that browser cookie so that your website sends the cookie. It gets saved and the customer gets a lifetime ID. So no matter how many days later they come back to your website, they are going to be tracked and you're going to be able to tell, you know, what was the first time they engaged with you and how many other times they engaged with you. And there's a lot of apps that do this. You know, there's like Elevar, uh, there's Blotout, which is usually the one that I use. And then there's, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, I like Blotout. Uh, it's, it's, I believe that it has the strongest technical backend system. So there's different ways of creating a lifetime ID and, you know, tracking customers through across the journey. So there's like JavaScript hacks that you can do, um, which is some of these two. I think what Elevar does is anytime there's an interaction with your website, along with the Shopify event, it sends an event as well. Whereas Blotout is actually hosting your own server with all your customers' lifetime IDs and your cookies. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't miss anything. Uh, it also has really good venture capital funding. So it's got, the, it's got the cash behind it and the engineering team to support. Um, and what that is doing is exactly what I said. So it's sending the data back to the platforms, back to Meta, back to TikTok, back to Snap, back to Klaviyo. Um, and Klaviyo, is, it's important. So this is also retention.com, which does a similar thing where all it's doing is, is someone signs up to your email list. If they come back 10 days later, Klaviyo doesn't know it's the same person. So if they add to cart and they've given you their email previously, you cannot send them an add to cart flow email mm. because Klaviyo doesn't know. With Blotout, Klaviyo knows, hey, this person came 10 days ago. Let me send them it. So you're instantly getting more money from your flows, which is a selling point for things like retention.com. But Blotout does all of that. So how does it work? Is it obviously in the in the technical like aspect in the back end is something that you really understand, you're really passionate about. The way it works, is it very different to some of the OGs in the space, like your high rows and your triple whale, or is it, is it using a different mechanism or have they just been able to do that in a slightly more cost-effective way? Yeah, it's different. Uh, and it's all different in different ways, depending on which platform you're talking about. So high rows, for example, is generally UTM based. You know, you click an ad and it goes to the UTM. And so, okay, I know the first UTM that this person came from. What it doesn't do is send the data back to the platform. And that's where blot out differentiates. Same with triple whale. It has your, you've got a triple pixel, which is tracking what everyone's doing. And that gives you front end attribution to say, yes, they came from this campaign and they purchase. What it doesn't do is send the data back to Meta or back to TikTok to say, hey, this person that you sent to my website eight days ago, they just came back and they added to cart. And Meta's like, oh, sweet. Let me add them back into the pool mm -hmm. of targeting because I know that I brought them to your website and they just visited again. So that remarketing aspect that was lost from iOS 14 kind of comes back a little bit. So, so what stage, obviously some of these, um, some of these like apps can be, can be quite expensive. I haven't looked into blood out specifically myself until I was doing some research in, on you today. And I come across that one at what stage of revenue, say per year or per month, wherever you want to look at it, do you think that it could be really worth e-commerce brands investing in a technology like block out, blood, blood out, sorry. Yeah. I'd say, you know, at, at when you're spending like 500 per day, um, it's probably worth it. Um, with blot out, uh, you, you know, you're probably looking at 500 per month. Mm -hmm. And so when you're spending 500 per day to get US the or AUD, AUD, AUD. Okay. Um, that's all right. You know, and, and when you're spending that amount, you're like, well, I might as well make sure that the algorithm is because even if I get 10% increase, that's a return on investment. Mm. Plus with blot out, you know, we partner with blot out. And so we have, you know, good, good agency rates with them. And we have a front end that comes onto that as well. So you don't actually need to pay for triple whale well on top because you have a, similar tool that Blotout has, um, which is called Emotive, which gives you front end attribution of your campaign. So it tells you like, here's what Facebook is attributing. Here's what I'm attributing based on proper <laughs> yeah. attribution. And as we know, it's very different. Very to what, different. To what Facebook says. Um, obviously we're sitting here first, second of October, I think. Um, Black Friday is very, very close around the corner. I'm kind of in the peak of preparing for that. If some brand wanted to implement, say, blot out before then, how long's the integration process? Could they get set up in a week, two weeks? What's the sort of yeah, immediately. time frame? You can get set up immediately. So, you know, one or two days to set up and, and you're good to go. I guess the only thing is you don't have the data from the previous months now, which is, which is helpful because when all these people come to your website in Q4 and the first time they came to your website was Q1, then you would send that data back to the platform. Say, hey, these guys are coming back, target yeah. them with ads. Um, but you know, it's, it's never too late. So, you know, it's still, still always a good time. Um, and yeah, it just gives you confidence. I think mm. that, Hey, I know that my data is solid and it replaces the default Shopify conversions, API integration. And improves. Um, and just last question on that before we move on to the black Friday prep stuff, because a lot of the Evcon brands I'm speaking to are really in the midst of their, their, their preparations and particularly around creatives and getting everything prepared with blot out. Do you know, 
the way it works? Like, is it month to month? Is it six month commitment, a yearly commitment? Do you know how it works in terms of that? Um, yeah, Blot Out is actually just a Shopify app. Okay, so, yeah, so you can, can literally cancel it at a month. Yeah, oh, yeah. beautiful. Um, so definitely one, I think, for a lot of value for people that are starting to increase their their paid ad spend to look into that. Now, Black Friday, obviously, you know, Q4 is the season where generally like, you know, e-commerce brands are doing the biggest numbers. What, because you've been around many, many Black Fridays now. It's yeah. not, not your first Black Friday period. You're working with, you know, quite, you know, a range of different size brands. Some, as you said, in the in the heavily in the eight figure mark uh, at the moment, what does good Black Friday preparation look like and what should brands be doing now or even like a month ago, but say now to ensure that they're going to have the most successful Black Friday period they could? Yeah. I mean, Black Friday is always an interesting one. Last year, we probably saw the earliest Black Fridays, you know, October, people are already starting their Black Friday sale. I feel like this year we are going to see more normal Black Fridays. This year, Black Friday is one week later, which means that, you know, Black Friday goes into Christmas uh, sales basically into December because Cyber Monday is in December. And so you're going to ha have less time period between your Christmas cutoff dates uh, for Black Friday. So you could extend your Black Friday sale all the way through and just say, yeah, this is Christmas orders. And then your Black Friday ends when the Christmas orders finish. Yeah. Uh, so that's probably something that I would probably recommend just cutting, going all the way through. Um, but yeah, Black Friday planning, you know, from an ad perspective, it's all about creative variety. Like uh, when I'm looking at some of the accounts that we've just started this year and I'm like, what did you guys do last year? And I'm seeing like two different creatives for Black Friday, like Black Friday sale, 20% off. That's it. One <laughs> ad and you're running the sale for, you know, two to three weeks. It's going to get fatigued real fast. So when yeah. we're building out creatives, we're looking at building out, you know, 30 to 40 different assets. And that's a mix of 20 videos and 20 statics. And within the statics, we've got lifestyle content, UGC content, product content. Within the creatives, we've got UGC content, professional content, you know, boomerangs, uh, everything, different products. You need to have variety in, you, people are going to get bored and they're going to be seeing hundreds of offers. Thousands uh, of offers. Thousands yeah. of offers. And the, you'll probably have a high frequency during that time because you'll be spending a lot, but you don't want to be showing people the same ad again. If they click your ad once and they don't buy, they're probably not going to click again and buy unless it's something very different. So what you need to look at is how do you merchandise your brand in a different way that to what you've done, you know, throughout. So yes, you've got your default 20% off, 25%, whatever you're doing your sale or your spend and save offer. Um, you know, can, can we do some free gifts with uh, partnering with other brands or have some sort of special product that we can have that we can offer uh, as a free gift? Can we create a new bundle specifically for Black Friday? You know, think about your brand in a new way. Even if you've only got two or three products, you, you, you've got to innovate and do something a little bit different. But at the least, just have a good amount of creative. So don't, yeah. don't do last minute planning, you know, have creators that are doing a bit of content for you, have a photo shoot, some yeah. fresh imagery that you can put out there, have a good amount of graphics and videos ready so that you're not getting any fatigue. The, the biggest thing as well, I think some of the easy, easier ways, um, you just get, gave a, a lot of examples. I think creative is obviously the number one, but then because you want to be able to stand out, everyone's going to be running a Black Friday, you know, sale in some way, shape or form, whether it's a discount or buy one, get one free, buy one, get one half price, blah, blah, blah. People tier all sort of gifts. What's some interesting or creative offer structures that you've seen work quite well for brands in the past, just to put some ideas in the heads of people that are listening? Yeah, I think, you, you know, you don't want to go too complex with your offer. So you want to have your baseline offer, which is either going to be a percentage discount a dollar discount or like a tiered discount, which is spend 50, you get this, spend 75, spend 100, you get this yep. percentage off. But then you can add on top of that uh, something that's simple and something that it has to be done automatically. So don't make your customers have to add to cart and then add this to cart, add the gift to cart. Like it's got to be automated and it's got to be very simple and you need to tell the customer what's going to happen. So, you know, in your cart page, you should tell them like, hey, if you add another $20, you're going to get this gift. Yeah. You know, and the gift gets added to their cart automatically when they do that. You have to smooth it and simplify that process. Free gifting, tiered gifting is a really good way I've seen to when you're discounting, still maintain or even increase your average order value during Black Friday. So last year we had a lot of brands that did three free gifts, up to three. And so you spend 75, you get one gift. Then you spend 120, you get another gift. 150, you get another gift. So in a way, it kind of feels like, yes, there's going to be margin in those gifts, but hopefully you've built it in a way so that you're hitting a new tier and you're able to add on that gift uh, and people love free gifts. Um, so that's one way. Bundling, um, November, Black Friday, people buy more for Christmas than they do in Black Friday, than they do actual Christmas. For sure. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is your time to give people like, hey, you know, buy for the whole family, you know, buy, buy yeah. four, buy five, giving them quantity breaks, discounts. So, you know, here's your best friend bundle. 
you know, here's buy two, buy three. Um, any complimentary products that you've got, add them on in, as, uh, you know, into the bundle. Um, also just a- adding on other sort of mechanisms like, hey, we're doing free shipping on Black Friday day or do those for those four days or free express shipping. Yeah. People want to get their products fast, um, especially with Amazon Prime. Like, you know, that's one of the things where I'm waiting, waiting for Shopify to, to get on top of that. Like, how do we compete with Amazon Prime? next day delivery um, and offering free express shipping is going to be one of those ways. So if you can negotiate with your, uh, you know, your, your, your partner, your shipping partner and get, get some good shipping rates. Yeah. Um, or if your product's hopefully not too heavy, uh, you know, that's going to play into there. Um, and yeah, honestly, anything else that you can merchandise and throughout the sale, like if you're running a three week sale, you want to give people a different message every time. So if you're going to be sending out email campaigns, try to make it not just, Hey, we're running 25% off or oh, reminder. It's 25% off because like I said, like they haven't done it the first time. They're probably not going to do it the second time. Mm. But if you can say, here's our black Friday today, we're giving you a free gift today. We're refunding a hundred dollars. Uh, we're refunding five orders. First five orders are coming today. We're, we're refunding them. You know, today uh, we're giving you this extra special discount today. We're doing a partnership with this brand. You know, today we're doing free express shipping. Every time they get an email from you, something different. Merchandise your store in a different way. I think that's really, um, there's so many exciting ideas. So for people that are in this space, there's there's a lot you can do. Um, I think like we're getting pretty close in terms of time frame. So start putting the work in now. Um, one question I do want to ask off the back of this kind of exciting talk about, you know, key sale dates and key sale periods. Um, obviously these, you know, these numbers, they don't happen every day. They're, you know, key sale periods for a reason. People can't afford to discount at these levels year round. But what's some of the most successful periods, whether it be a end of financial year, a Black Friday, like what's a really exciting like case study that you've been a part of where you were a part of the preparation, you hit live and you saw the numbers come in and you're breaking records. Cause I know you've been a part of that many times for many different brands, but what's one that comes to, to mind that you could share one or two, you don't have to say the brand, who they are, if you don't want to, um, of course. But yeah, take take us behind the scenes on, on one or two of those examples. Well, my favorite is always new product launches because at that point it's like, hey, it's not just a promotion. It's not end of financial. It's not click frenzy. You've got all those promotions. They always do well. You know, no doubt people are almost wired to buy something at a discount if they're buying it online. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. like, I would just walk into That's the store crazy and buy the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Unless you're you've got some serious innovation that you cannot buy anywhere. And there's some brands that have done that really well. You know, like someone like Eight Sleep. They've got something Crazy. that literally no one else has and no one can create. And their website's uh, so good as well. Yeah, and there's so much barrier to entry to that product. Um, <laughs> Imagine just trying to yeah, copy uh, that and start up. Good luck. You can't. Yeah, exactly. So that it, when you have innovation, also, but new product launches has to be fair. So we did a new product launch maybe three weeks ago, mm-hmm. and the brand was probably breaking even for the last two months prior to it, but they had a really good product. It was just that they only had a one product store. So they did a new product launch, two new products, um, you know, really innovative, something new, something different. They did a lot of hype organically for it. And this is one where they had the founder had a personal brand. So building hype, showing the process of creating the product, running, uh, you know, uh, promotions and running competitions on their organic page to say, Hey, you know, comment and you'll be one of the first to get this product. A lot of hype was built. And, you know, within the first launch, I think within the first week, they did maybe 150 K just off that launch. And, uh, yeah, so that was just really fun preparing everything for that, you know, having all the ads ready for that. Um, and this is an ad style that did actually really well is the podcast style ad. Mm. So, you know, and radio service you should offer here. Yeah. <laughs> People come in come and in, like, eh? you know, do a podcast. So, you know, and you we've can- actually got a few of those we're going to send to you for, for Black Friday anyway. We've got, <laughs> yeah. we've got a few of them that we're working on. Yeah. Awesome. So I think that's, and that's, yeah. So podcast style creative where you're, you kind of feel like you're talking to it and people feel like it's edgetainment because you're getting yep. entertained because you're like, Oh, what are, what are people talking about? Well, what is this? Let me hear about it. They give you the opportunity to tell them and then you kind of show them the product, the benefit that it has. And, you know, obviously directing them to a really good landing page. Uh, and you do that. And because depending on the way that you can do it, there's different styles of, you know, podcast ads and, and, and clips that I've seen repurposed for ads. They also come across like, depending on how you set it up, really organic as well for the listener. Yeah. It's like, it could even be the founder talking, but you would never know. And it just seems like two girls chatting about their experience and like, wow, I want to be a part of that. So I think my, my feeling is I don't think it's been overdone yet. That's going to be one of those like e-com hacks that work really good for three months or six months or whatever. Yeah. And then everyone's going to get onto it and then it'll stop working. So Maybe try that before everyone else does if you want to get as much of the juice out of that lemon as you can. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we've had brands trying a lot of things. We've some some have been a bit cheeky, and they'll use like celebrity podcasts. You know, we've <laughs> seen a lot of the Joe Rogan yeah. ones that repurpose. Yeah, first. yeah, exactly. And if you've got like a supplement that you're selling that they're talking about in the product, that kind of thing. Um, you know, seeing Brian Johnson now, <laughs> he's selling <laughs> yeah. some sort of supplement. And he's mentioned it, then you you put his face on it. But my favorite ones are the ones that are like actually from the brand. They're probably set up, but it's like the guy in the podcast like pulls it out of his pocket or something. And he's like, <laughs> man, check out these jeans. They're so good. You know, true yeah. classic. That kind kind of thing or, or like the the there's like the, the muscle mind one where they pull out they have a drink it's like yeah this is all i drink now yeah you know, i've seen them drink. they're really good i've seen heaps of them actually um that's really cool oh, what do you think's the biggest like sales event like you've been a part of for a brand like whether it be a day whether it be a week whether it be a month like what's something that you just broke all records and you're like shit like this is the power of ecom yeah, I mean, oh, there's there's been a lot, but you know, something like EHP Labs is always always big. Like they've got a huge following, and uh, is the founder actually? You know, I, I I met him and he reached out to me and he was like, hey, you know, I'm looking for someone to to run ads, and I think maybe he, he knew George or something like yeah. that. So I went to their office and and I sh you know shortly after that, they've done so many launches, but Oxy Shred, you know, it's uh, <laughs> like it, they, they, he has a team of like twenty people whose job is to just manage ambassadors for the brand like it's, 20 yeah, people just to manage ambassadors like it's crazy and their office is is, is awesome the one in um like just Lead. up from board yeah yeah just up from broadway yeah, yeah with the cool like, yeah yeah lights exactly. when you drive so, past yeah yeah so i think the launch of oxy greens uh which oh, was like it's like, like a the greens powder the greens yeah, thing yeah ag1 yeah. ag1 that's, that's what i was thinking of yeah but um but I mean, everything they do is so good because, you know, I tasted it. And I was like, this is the first time a greens powder is actually tasting so good. Yeah. And I just wanted it. And he gave me a sample. I went into store to, to, to his, uh, to his, uh, to the office and he gives me this like tub of oxy greens and he gives me like 20 cans of oxy shred. <laughs> you know? And every time I'm, I'm tasting it, I'm like, this is awesome. Yeah. Zero calories. Um, so yeah, the, the launch of oxy greens was like, that was, that was huge. That's probably like a nine figure launch. Wow. Um, and he even said he was like, I didn't think we'd have a product that would be as successful as Oxy Shred, but Oxy Greens is is almost there. So what do you think of like that's a really great like tier one example of that? But you mentioned you work with a lot of brands and you know, they're innovating and releasing new products. What sort of products work really well? Like what sort of like complementary products to the brand's original hero product do you think work quite well as like, you know, adding either increasing AOV or bring, maybe it's a, it's a brand where it makes most of its money off its first purchase. And then you bring it in something that can, you know, be a consumable product or build some LTV off the back of that. What's like a good um, way that you like to see brands thinking about their product launches or secondary and complementary products? So I think it's, you've got a foundation and hopefully that's done really well. You've got one product that has just done really, really well, but it's like, how do we, uh, how do we innovate on that to create something that's complementary? But there's two ways of doing it, right? So there's the horizontal way of doing it, which is like, yes, I've got a face mask and now I've created a moisturizer. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh, and that's probably good because if your mask is sold really well, you will sell the moisturizer really well. But I think the cooler way to do it is like going into a new vertical. So we had a brand that made handbags um, or, or bags, duffel bags out of leather. And then they released a, a hoodie that you can wear like in the outback that's like full weather protected. And that became their top selling product when they released wow. that. And that's like going into a new vertical. You're mm -hmm. going from bags into, you know, to, into outerwear, which was, which was crazy to see. So I think it's like going out of the box and seeing like, what can you do, but still using your existing. So they were able to use their manufacturing facility mm. to create this product, you know? So I think you just have to do that out of the box, that innovation, something that you can create. Um, and that's going to help you stand out. So let me ask you this. Obviously, we spoke about it, this at the start of the podcast. You clearly love what you do and are passionate about it and are really good at it. But if you were going to leave Nuva behind, you drop the drop the agency and you're like, that's it. I've seen too many brands succeed. I'm going to start my own. What sort of products or what sort of niche do you think you would be in if you're like 2025, I'm going to build something for myself? Oh, I mean, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, something that I think about because I'm like, yeah, I know how to do a lot of it, the marketing aspect of it. But then also when I see people like you and George and all the other founders I work with, the hard work that you guys do, I'm like, man, I don't know if I, if that hustle even. even yeah. And me. like you said, just the margins piece. Yeah. People, people see like econ business is killing it. And like, they'll be like, you can get that product for like a fifth of the price on, on Alibaba. We'll go do it then and we'll yeah. see. No, if it there's was like, so much more behind so much it. Behind the work it. behind it is is intense. The cash flow is difficult to mm -hmm. manage. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, new product development, it's not easy. And also it needs a different mind. I think it needs someone like, you know, like Iris or George. They're good examples. They're, they're, 
they're inventors of their pro- like yeah. really passionate about their product. Like George, I can't believe this. He's went from hair removal to hair care. Yeah. And like we talk about, we talk about, you know, some of the products he's been working on and he's like, dude, he knows all the ingredients of all the yep. products and what they're good for and what they're not and what he doesn't want in it. Become obsessed with your product and the product industry yeah. that you're in. It's like the it's visionary really good thinking. recipe. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, you know, the Steve Jobs thinking. And I don't know if I consider myself that. And it's, again, it's just knowing yourself. And I feel like for me, I'm an operator. You know, I yeah. take your vision, mm-hmm. I implement mm-hmm. it. And I implement it really well. I execute it yeah. with attention to detail. I had this conversation with Anita on last week's pod um, about the difference between founders and CEOs. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely a founder. Um, you said you're like, obviously you start businesses, but like the operator, like a CEO, I think that's one thing that's unique about George. I think he does have both. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think that what's, but he doesn't like, he works so hard all the time. Yeah. That's barely any life yeah. works himself into sickness at times. But that's one thing about George that he's really good at both, but it's, it's cool that you have that awareness that I love being the operator, the one that runs everything, sets up processes, scales businesses, creates systems and everything like that. Um, so yeah, don't, don't stop what you're doing. Yeah, There'll be a lot of I brands mean, that miss your work <laughs> if you did. Yeah. And, and that's what I like. Like I like, you know, being reliable and being their partner and being yeah. there for them. Um, but you know, if I was to do a product, I honestly, I, I don't know. I, th- I think I like the cleaning space. Okay. Um, you know, there's, there's brands like Blue Land where they have like a tablet that you drop in and then you can make any sort of cleaning product out of it. I think I, that was a cool, cool sort mm-hmm. of innovation that I saw where I was like, Oh yeah, this could be, this could be something. Some good. industries that haven't been as e commerceified as like beauty. Yeah. It's like, there's a billion you know, e-commerce yeah. product, like co what co did in the cleaning space, but three, three and a half years ago now they exploded. Yeah. Um, I was having conversations around some people in different industries, which I won't say on the podcast or everyone will want to get into that because I'm mentoring them. And you know, I, I, I keep, I keep that stuff, um, you know, confidential, but there's some industries, if you have a think about it, that haven't become e-commerceified yet. And I don't know if that's a word, but we're making well, disrupted. it a word. disrupted in, in that way yet. And I think if you can do something that maybe is a little bit less sexy, like cleaning products yeah. and go and innovate in that, then you can have a lot of success. Yeah. And you can be a relatively early mover in the space, even though e-com started to mature a little bit, as you said, yeah. still probably 90% of, you know, transactions are done in store. Um, but it's a little bit of an interesting way to think about it before you just go, okay, beauty works. I'm going to go in that or health and supplements works. I'm going to go in that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, yeah. Something that you kind of understand or something that you see like a gap in yourself, like every day I'm cleaning and I'm like, I think this could be better. (laughs) I feel like I shouldn't have to do this. Um, but also like one of it's a lot of it is how you back that product, how you market that product. And Mm -hmm. I think products to have an easy launch need to be uh, celebrity led. I feel like that's such a hack. Like it's like, if there's a backing behind it, people will just buy it. At the end of the day, it has to be a great product. Mm-hmm. But if you've got a following already, people are going to go behind it. So if I was to launch a product, I feel like I would need to find someone that I could be like, hey, you've got the backing. Are you passionate about this? Yeah. And, and then partnerships, and then right? Exactly. It's, it's the biggest hack. Influencers start a brand if they've got an engaged community. Who knows if it'll be successful two years from now because then it comes down to you, like your real business mind and you have to be an operator as well. But you can guarantee they're going to have a successful launch and a successful first couple of months back off the, the back of that momentum. And I said this to Nita in that podcast as well. Uh, like, you know, 18 year olds ask me all the time, I've got no money. Where should I, you know, what business should I start? Dude, don't worry about that. Build a following. If you can build 50,000 followers in a year or two or 100,000 followers, like obviously you can grow way quicker than that if you, you hack viral content then launch any business you want around a product you're genuinely passionate about that people can see you use and interact with. And it's a recipe for almost guaranteed success, like you said. Yeah. And I mean, on that note, what should you do when you're 18? I'm kind of waiting for TikTok shop to come out in Australia because the amount of 18 year old millionaires that TikTok shop has created in the U S is insane. Yeah. Yeah. You know, these guys are selling, you know, 10 million GMV for, for huge brands. Um, and yeah, that's going off. And I've been lucky enough that some brands actually have access to the U S UK TikTok shop and I've been running the ads and okay. yeah, it goes off. You have you know? to have like an address over there to be able yes. to register. It you is, have to it have is, like a social security number. Yeah. It's really difficult. It's really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have someone on the ground. Yeah. Um, now I want to shift a little bit before we wrap up and kind of get behind the scenes of what makes you such an, an, an effective entrepreneur. Um, in your life. Now, obviously so much of high performance is linked back to, you know, routines, habits, you know, um, time management in particular, give everyone a little bit of an understanding about how you approach, you know, habits and routine. And then once subsequently, I think time management, like when you're in work, time management, I think that'll be really interesting to hear your approach to all of that. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm such a creature of habit. And when I'm like out of routine, I'm kind of like lost. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's like a pro and a con because we I recently traveled to Europe with my wife and I was like struggling because I'm like, how do I work and travel? Because usually I'm just working and it's so much easier. But now I have to work and travel at the same time, you know? And I'm, I mean, you probably experienced that as well. Yeah. When, you, when you're traveling. I've never had a holiday that was a complete, since we launched the business, yeah. I've never had a, a actual full holiday. It just yeah. doesn't happen. But your mindset is so important, you know, when you're running the business. Because it is like whatever's happening in your personal life and your general life is going to go into your business. That's how your yeah. business is going to be. If you're performing well in that personal life, then I believe you perform well in business as well. So, you know, when I have my routine, you know, wake up at a certain time, do a certain day routine, uh, you know, fitness is so important, you know, doing exercise, being healthy. Um, I know we, we both do a bit of martial arts, yes. you know, um, going to the gym, staying fit, being happy with yourself, uh, taking care of yourself. I also believe that allows you to then take care of others. So, you know, I'm married now and, and all that. And that's again, been something that's just been really helpful to have because I'm, I'm seeing all my friends and they're like trying to find love trying to find a partner and it's kind of like oh it's nice that I have this part of my life just you know sorted for me and I think that's helped the business a lot as well because the chase of all those other things which are arguably the most important thing of the human experience can be a massive distraction where I remember when we were younger say I was mid-20s I'm 30 now and you know everyone was spurting around oh don't get a don't get a girlfriend don't get a partner it'll be too distracting for you no if you find the wrong partner, potentially, if they don't understand who you are and your purpose and your goals, absolutely, it won't work. But if you find the right person who can come in and add to that, create a life with you, understand where you're going, what you want to achieve and figure a way to complement that either. You know, I've seen a lot of successful businesses, actually the partners and the husband and wife working together or even just supporting that in a different way. Not everyone needs to be a relationship with two people that are as driven in the same business, but figuring out a way that you know, you can work together in, in unison, creates much better performance in terms of what the entrepreneur themselves can output. That's something I've heard from you now and from many it's other people. It's human nature, I think, to crave, you know, love and to, to want to have a partnership and companionship, you know. Mm -hmm. So having a really good relationship life gives you a good business life. And also it's like a part of you that's kind of, you know, it's not a gap. It kind of yeah. feels like that sometimes. How did you, how did you manage the working on the trip? How did you sort of segment your time? Because you obviously want to enjoy your trips, but you honestly, you obviously have responsibilities and things you want to at least keep, keep moving forward while you're there. How did you balance that? Yeah. I mean, it was a good experience in putting together better processes and, <laughs> and delegating, yeah. uh, you know, where possible. Um, but, you know, you just have to manage it. Like it's you, when we were on the trip, we couldn't have intense tours booked every single day. We did a bit of slow traveling. You know, we had extra days in a city because I knew I'd have some time where, hey, I just got a few hours. I've just got to yeah. smash out some things to do. So I, I managed to manage. I think it was actually a really good experience because now I've come back and I'm like, hey, I've got more time now because I feel like I've put these processes in place and we're able to do this better. That's the way I like to navigate it on travel. And there's, there's no, um, there's no black or white, like some, you know, sometimes you got to work more, like a little bit more than you want on, on, on trips. Sometimes, you know, your team's running it all for you and you can have a few days without having to do anything. But the way I would try and navigate is like approximately every second day I'll do four hours in the morning and then go out. So it's like, I don't want to have to do a few hours of work every single day on a trip, but if I can, you know, the preparation before, if you're someone with a business that has even one or two staff or you have a team, yeah. it's all in the preparation, right? And hopefully you don't need to get too involved, but the way I did it, yeah. So a few hours in the morning, every second day, do what I need to do. And then I've still got in between that, you got the rest of the afternoon and the rest of the next day completely free. Um, because it's like you said, like, you can be in business and, you know, you, can, you can take that path where you build a hundred million dollar business seller, then you can just go on a holiday forever. But most people are in that stage where they're still on the build. They want to be able to enjoy their lives at the same time yeah, exactly. and not have to be completely <laughs> binary one or the other. And I think it's, it's a challenge, but you grow from it. Yeah, exactly. And, and a, lot, a lot, part of me was resisting it a lot. Like my wife wanted to travel for a while and I've been like, oh, I don't know if I can do it, <laughs> yeah. but I'm glad I did because yeah, you, you learn so much from the trip and, and there's a lot of lessons just from the trip as well. So, and, um, for you personally, congratulations, kid on, kid on the way next year, yep. I believe, um, <laughs> that'll be a whole other level that you have to integrate and I'm sure it'll teach you a lot, yeah, but absolutely. everyone tells me it, it, it doesn't make you a worse entrepreneur. It makes you a better entrepreneur. The first month or two, you're trying to figure everything out. I'm sure <laughs> yeah. it'll be a little bit hectic. Um, sleepless nights. Are you looking forward <laughs> to that? What's, what's kind of your game plan for that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm pretty excited now. So yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's just uh, something new, I guess for me. A lot of it, I was like, you know, I'm very logical as well when I think. So I'm like, is it the right time? Am I ready? <laughs> you know, but then I I was like, look, 
at the end of the day, do you want kids? Yes or no? And the answer yeah. is yes. Okay. Then it's about when do you want them? And I thought, well, I, you know, I've, it, you're never going to be truly ready for it. Right. So you have to just, you know, kind of take, take the step as you do, but obviously like a careful calculated step <laughs> knowing that you, you, you're going to be responsible for someone for sure. Um, and knowing that you're, you know, you're, you're in a good mind space for it, I think is probably the most important thing. And I feel like I'm in, I'm in that headspace now where I've, I understand myself. I've grown at, to a good point. You know, business is good, smooth. I'm happy with it. And uh, yeah, I'm ready for, for what life has next. Exciting. Um, and on that time management piece, that's going to be challenged, obviously, when, 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 the, when, the, when the kid comes and you've got to deal with that. But day to day in your business, you obviously work with not too many clients, which, which makes you be able to do things in a, in a streamlined way. But how do you allocate your time and priorities? Because it's not just like you're working. I wake up and working on my business each and every day. You're working across multiple other people's businesses. How do you manage your time effectively? It's just having uh, really efficient systems, processes, and, um, you know, being able to monitor everything really quickly. So for all my clients, you know, I wake up and I have a spreadsheet which tells me all of their spend and their ROAS mm -hmm. and their revenue automatically every day. So at a glance, every client, I can see it. And then it's like color coded as well. So I can see who's green, really who's quickly, yellow, right? need who's red, jump into you know, what needs to be done. You know, I've got good system in Slack where I've got all my reminders set up. My to-do list is set up for the day before I start the day. So I know yeah. like, cool, this is the stuff I have to go. So you plan out your day the, the night before. Yeah. I really like yeah, that. It really absolutely. Helps. Absolutely. I do inbox zero as well. So I get mm -hmm. my Gmail down to zero really fast. Um, that's not a skill know. I've been able to pick up. <laughs> <laughs> you were shaking his head. Yeah. Oh, the day I can get to inbox zero, it will be a good day. I feel like <laughs> if you, if you get to that point, maintain it because if you let it slip, oof, it's hard to ever claw back. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, the G, it's kind of like a to-do list for me, you know? So, uh, when those emails are zero, I'm like, cool. Everything. So I think it's is, different is in done. agency space. Cause yeah. like you're, you're a lot more of your emails are, like actual things, service-based things for you yeah. to go and do. Whereas like for me, it's like mental, um, too many things. Um, but, um, to that point as well, I know you're someone who places a lot of emphasis on education, developing your skills, personal development. What's your general approach and ethos towards all of that? Yeah. On a, it's just, you know, just being on the lookout, you know, keeping your ears open, whether that's looking at LinkedIn and following certain people that are in that space. Like I follow all of meta staff directly as well, you know, TikTok staff directly. I want to know what they're That's talking cool. about. What so you presenting. can really have that, you know, connection to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, looking at what brands are doing. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not someone that's going to be like, my process is the best process. Like I want to be proven wrong. I want someone to tell me like, Hey, this is better, you know? And that's where, when I followed some of the better uh, people, the marketers uh, in, in the U S and I was like, these guys are doing it better. You know, and I want to be there. And I knew if I could offer that here, that level of expertise, um, then, you know, we'd, I'd, be, I'd be solid. And that's kind of what I see in the agency space. They're getting a bit complacent. They're afraid to do the hard work. Like, like I just want to run your ads. You know, I, there was, when I, I had an opportunity to work with Davey Fogarty from mm -hmm. uh, the, the Udi founder and recently Shark Tank Australia judge as well last year. Um, and, you know, I, we were running a lot of different agencies and I was, and, and he basically, I came in as kind of like a fractional CMO for, for some of his brand, legacy brands, calming blankets and pub mm -hmm. naps. And my job was just to sell out the stock that we had um, so that way he can prepare them for 2025 relaunch or whenever that, yeah. whenever that happens, you know? So when, when we did that and there was agencies running it, I'm like, Hey guys, we're, we're running the ads. I'm happy for you to keep it, even though I, I can take over, but <laughs> what's the plan with the creatives? Like we don't do creatives. And I'm like, how can an agency not do creatives anymore? And what's, what are we paying you for? Just, you know, one campaign in the account didn't make sense to me. So, you know, when I came in, I took over, I did everything, did the whole websites, redid all the emails. And you know, we had like eight, nine months of stock that we probably finished in like two or three months, just wow. clean everything up, actually do the work that had to be done. You know, and that, yeah, so that was it. That was an awesome experience. I think another one is obviously it's a skill acquisition why they don't, but two, it's in being, in way to, you know, uh, you know, not to have to take accountability. Oh, exactly. it's not working because we don't have the right creatives. Yeah. Yeah. Like, why don't, if you really want to be a good agency, yeah. figure out a way to create the creatives your as website's well. Website's not there, you know, mm -hmm. even, um, yeah. Cause I got to the point where I would unmask everything. I'd be like, your website's a problem. I'll sort it. I'll sort that. Your creative's a problem. I will sort it. But I got to a point where I was like, your unit economics are the problem. <laughs> and I'm getting to a point where I'm like, I'm, you know what, I'm going to sort this too. Yeah. So I'm getting into the, that's where profitability management now is a big thing for me. Cause I'm like, I want to know your fixed expenses. I want to know your variable expenses. How do we need to price your product? How do we need to build out bundles and products so that we market it in a way 
that it all works out. So how would how would a brand um, obviously they could book in a call with you and have that conversation? You you run a capacity a lot of the time. Sometimes they're open, but if someone wants to do this themselves. I know it's difficult on a podcast, it's much easier if you could have your Google <laughs> sheet open, but what's like your rough process for coming up with your profitability um, kind of like modeling to realize where does the business need to be to, you know, cruise, to scale and, and so on and so forth? Yeah, I think it starts off with really simply just forecasting, you know, what, what all your numbers are. So that's going to start with what's your ad spend? What are your fixed expenses in the business? So now you've immediately, you've got, this is your total expense. And, you know, what's your margin? You need to know your margins really well. Like what uh, if, and the way to calculate it really simply is look at your average order value and just look at your total cost of goods uh, and, and, and figure out how much are you making on each order, right? And then you can figure out how many orders do I need to get then to break even. Mm -hmm. And once you figure that out, anything above that is going to hopefully be profitable. Yeah. So you need to know what your break even point is. Do you use any um, softwares? There's a, I think there's a few that has emerged over the last year or two, like daily profitability calculators. Do you have any that use that or you do it kind of a bit manually? There's a few of them. I mean, Lifetimely does it now. So that's always a good one, which, and it also gives you like your customer lifetime data. So in Lifetimely, you put all your fixed, you put, and it gets your marketing costs automatically and it tells you that. I mean, Triple Whale has a free dashboard, which I think does that as well. Um, Beef Profit, True Profit, all these <laughs> apps that you can set up in Shopify. So it's pretty easy, but I mean, the amount of people founders that haven't done it or don't understand yeah. the numbers. Yeah. Well, I'm always surprised. You're just like an encyclopedia of e-commerce knowledge. You can ask you any <laughs> yeah. question about anything and you pretty much have an answer. That's what's really uh, fun about preparing for this. I'm like, I don't need to watch anything. No, no, no. I just anything that I want to know. I'm just going to ask Manu today. Um, so what's next? What's coming from, from you, Nuva? Obviously you've got a big like personal things in the works, but for those that, you know, want to reach out, follow along, what, what can people expect to see from you over the next 12 months? Yeah. Well, look, I'm, I'm on the lookout. I'm waiting for what's next. I mean, AI is, is what everyone's talking about now. And so I'm still early stage. I'm figuring out like, obviously we have the initial use, which is, yes, you can write the copy, you can write landing page copy. Um, the good ones that my clients do is they will set up a GPT for their brand. And like, Hey, this GPT has all of my brand's knowledge. And then I can go in and be like, what is the size of this product? Or what's the best That's way cool. to sell it? What's the benefit of this product? Or what's the new product that are coming out? You know? yeah. And it's got all that information. So I can ask them all those questions. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to see like what happens with graphics and statics and video creative and how can we streamline that? Yeah, even text more. of photo, text of uh, video. Yeah, exactly. Simon Beard's a really good follow for all that sort of stuff. Do you follow him? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the things that he shares is quite interesting. Um, has it impacted your business much yet, AI, or is it sort of that, you know, elementary is like really copywriting is the easiest way to I'd get I'd say it's pretty it. early. Like it's, yeah. it's not at a point where it's fundamental. Like it's not necessary in your business right now. Like yeah. you can have a brand, you can do really well without it, mm -hmm. um, but it can definitely help. Yeah, massively, massively. Um, and for those that want to, you know, just follow along, reach out potentially when they're at the stage, if they're looking for an agency, where's the best place people can find you? Yeah, just go on the website, nuva.com.au and then you can follow me on all my socials, message me anywhere. <laughs> awesome, man. Uh, I was really good to get you in. Um, have a, have a, have a good chat like this hour 45. We've done well. We could have easily done another hour, but I think we'll leave it there. I think attention spans in 2024, uh, diminishing. Um, but this was a really good conversation, man. We'll have to do it again one day. Appreciate you coming in, providing so much value. Um, really appreciate it, man. Thanks Thank for you. having me. It was awesome. Sure. Thanks bro. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode or you got something out of it, do yourself a favor, do me a favor, do your friends a favor and share this with them and they can come along on this journey with us. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.